Hello everyone, it is 2.08 Central Standard Time. I'm right on time, because I always aim for 2.08. Usually I aim for two, and it takes me eight extra minutes to get things accomplished. So I am hoping that some of you are staying at home and staying safe. So uh, we'll get started here as people roll in. I'm gonna go ahead and pull up some questions. Trucker Tammy, you are first, good job. Uh, let me pull this up really fast while I'm waiting for you guys to come on in. Hi, Manny. I uh, asked you guys yesterday via Facebook if you had any topics you'd like me to discuss. And uh, what I chose, I'm waiting for it to appear, of course. It's like, where is it? Hi, Shane. <laughs> American reefing has to work. That means you're on the stream from work. Good job. Where is my topic list? There we go. Found it. All right. So the, uh, the question was, what would you like me to stream about today? I, originally, I was supposed to be at a frag swap for the club, and that was today, and... Uh, as of, I think it was yesterday? No, I think it was two days ago. They announced and let everyone know that the event has been canceled because everywhere you go, uh, you're hearing announcements that if groups over 500 people are, uh, are being banned uh, just because, you know, trying to avoid spreading the coronavirus. So we are being affected that way. And next weekend, I was supposed to fly to Niagara Falls for the choral show there. And that one, too, was postponed until mid-July. So there's a lot of sh things being postponed everywhere. I heard that uh, ReefWorks, which I believe was in a couple of weeks, is postponed as well. They're in Seattle. And uh, there was fears about Interzoo in Germany. <laughs> I, heard broad I read that Broadway is closing any shows that are over 500 people attending and that the smaller theaters could still have half an audience. So it's a big deal. And there's a lot of people that are very worried, and I, I, I can't lie, I'm nervous. I mean, you just don't know what you've touched that was touched by someone before you, and who touched them, and back forth, all the way back to patient zero. You just don't know. And there's just no easy way to find out if you have it. It's not an inexpensive test. I, I read one place, the test was $2,000, so many people won't get it. Uh, there's those that just think they're sick and don't think it's related to corona, and so they're not being counted. I mean, it just goes on and on and on, and, you know, I could just fear monger for 20 minutes, but what's the point? Uh, just be safe, stay clean, clean everything around you. <laughs> I've been cleaning around my reef the last couple of days, and I have just been trying to think of how to steer clear of certain scenarios. And, I mean, man, you, I mean, I was thinking... You know, people are like, I want to wear a face mask. And I, I was thinking, what if you start seeing everyone walking around with rubber gloves on their hands, like to open the door to get milk out of the cabinet at the supermarket, or ice cream, or creamer, or, you know, those kind of things. Or the, you know how, you know, we worry about the handle of the shopping cart, and you can wipe that off. Well, what about the divider on the conveyor belt that you put between your food and the other person's food, you know, so that you don't pay for their food, or theirs, they're not paying for yours? You know, I see those things slide up all the time, and we just grab one and put it there. And that's just such a simple, minor thing. Uh, my mom told me yesterday that Costco is no longer handing out free food samples, and that the people's jobs that were to stand there and hand out samples are now wiping down the handles of all the freezer cabinets and refrigerated cabinets so that anyone that touches them will be safe. And then when you go to pump gas, you have to grab the handle, you have to enter a PIN code, and these are just a few examples, and I'm sure you can think of 2,000 more. So we just want to be really, really careful and avoid that. Okay, so someone mentioned, what's up with all the TP? So, one lucky person today is going to get a free roll of toilet paper sent to them because I'm worried you're not going to have enough. So I'm going to let Andrea pick that person. <laughs> also, we're giving away more Coral Magazines. Coral Magazine is the magazine I read where I want to learn about the reef hobby. And it talks about every kind of topic. There's so many issues. It's been around, I don't know, nine, ten years, maybe longer. And so Coral Magazine gave me a bunch to ship to you guys, and I'm shipping them to people in the United States. So we are going to pick five people during this hour, Andrea's in charge of that again, to determine who is going to get it, and then I will pay for postage and mail it to you. 
I uh, actually have to stand in line and wait for the teller, you know, the person at the uh, counter, to weigh each one and charge me, you know, three, four bucks. And I had one person receive an empty envelope that somehow the magazine came out of it and it just said, envelope empty. And I was thinking, I mean, I get it, but what? That is so weird. So that person didn't get a, a magazine. But that is not my fault. All right. Um, also, I found I was doing some cleaning in the back room uh, where I keep all the supplies for the things I sell for my shop. So I'll throw this on the screen just as a reminder. Please buy things from Me Loves Reef. It is what helps pay the bills. Uh, I was cleaning out in the back area. I have things I've been saving forever. I'm just the biggest hoarder. And I just save things that might be useful. And these things were not useful. As I was going through the closet, I found old keyboards, old mice, <laughs> not the living kind, not the dead kind. Uh, I found uh, routers and, uh, and, and video cards. And I, I run a Mac. <laughs> I don't need any of that. So I got rid of, it's all old. I mean, I've probably had it for, well, I've probably had it at least 10 years, if not longer, just sitting on the shelf in the box. And so I threw it all out and I got rid of it. And as I was moving and getting rid of things and decluttering, which was nice, I came across five t-shirts. So these are random t-shirts I've gotten over the years that I think were all XL, which is much too big for me. So I am going to be giving those away next week. I was going to do it today, but I can't find them now. <laughs> I, I mean, I put them somewhere, but I don't remember where I put them. So they are uh, missing at the moment. But as soon as I find them again, uh, I think we'll do it next weekend. And if you just have to be the right size, that's the bottom line. And, you know, hopefully you'll want a free shirt. These are shirts that I've gotten at different shows that were never worn, never used. They were too big. And I was like, really? I need a medium. And they just like, it's all we got. I'm like, thanks. And then I'm thinking in my head, why do I even bother taking it? I should just leave it behind for the person that deserves it, you know, that, that can fit it. So I'm going to give those away. So, and, you know, just, just to declutter, but not just throw in a landfill, right? Um, and then I wanted to talk about all the things I did this week with my own tank. So uh, if you are not following me on Instagram, you should be. And uh, because what I post on Instagram or what I post on Facebook are, you know, constant updates. Matter of fact, a lot of times, whatever I put on Instagram ends up on Facebook. It's just kind of auto forwards because they're linked. Uh, and so I've been posting pictures of projects I've been doing all this week. And one of the first things that I did, and I'll just go ahead and pull this up on the screen for you guys. So if you are listening to this, you're not going to see anything. But if you are watching, you're going to see some things. So um, I think yesterday I was really motivated. Well, maybe it was two days ago. Let me check the date on this one. What's the date? Oh, yeah. See, I did a lot yesterday. <laughs> I just went from project to project to project. So the first thing I wanted to do was... Uh, change out the RODI filters on my system. So the one on the left is the brand new one. The one on the right is seven months old, I believe, July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, Ooh, eight months old. And it was just time. You're supposed to replace your sediment filter and your carbon filters every six months. And again, on the left is a new one, on the right is the uh, old one. And you can even see the ring on the top discolored, which is kind of weird, it turned yellow. I don't know why I did that. That's, I think that's a first. And I changed the next carbon and that one as well. And I smelled them. And in the past, when I'd smell the carbon filter, you could smell chlorine coming off of it. But I barely smelled any. So I think the city of Fort Worth is using less chlorine in the water than it used to. And then my DI was completely orange to the top. It's been completely orange to the top for many months. But the TDS coming out has been zero, zero, zero every time I turn it on. So I thought, well, you know, I'll just keep using it until I get a zero reading. And I filled up the giant poly tank, as you guys know, a couple of weeks ago. And I thought, well, I'm going to use a lot of water. That's going to finish this thing off. And it was still zero. And I thought, I'm replacing the filters. I'm going to replace my DI at the same time. So what I do is I put the date on the front of my RO DI system on the housing. I mean, right there on the membrane housing where you can see the date. And remind yourself that it's time to change it so it doesn't get away from you. Also, I own a label maker. If you guys don't own one, I do recommend it. I think, you know, you could probably get, well, I'm sure you can get one on Amazon for nothing. But uh, I think I got this one at Office Depot for maybe 20 bucks. 
and then, you know, I have to buy a new spool, I don't know, once every couple of years. I even get worried, am I gonna be able to get the spool anymore? I've had this darn label maker so long. Printed the new label, and I put that on the front. I just stuck it over the old one instead of printing the entire phrase out. And uh, I've got my, and then I let it, I let the RO water come out for, well, I collected about two and a half gallons of RO water, uh, not DI, because I wanted the TDS to come down from the dust that comes off of a carbon filter. And if you are watching your RO system when you first turn it on, as soon as the carbon has been installed, and you see the water going through the different compartments, you may see like a swirling gray cloud kind of moving through the water. It's very uh, subtle. It won't last long within, if you weren't looking at it as it happens, you'll probably miss it because it's just mere seconds. But I saw it happen and that dust can get into your membrane and it can get out and it can end up adding a little bit of TDS to your water initially because it's trying to flush out these little particulates. So when you first install filters, you might get a higher TDS number coming out of the membrane than you're used to, and you're thinking, these are brand new filters, why did that happen? So by running it for, you know, I don't, I didn't time it, but I collected about two, two and a half gallons of water, and my TDS was all the way down to three, and then I knew that I was, you know, good to go, and I could start making DI whenever I was ready, and that's when I uh, closed the RO valve and opened up, or and let the system continue pressurizing and sending water into the DI. I didn't want to send any of that TDS that was in there, because, you know, at first after the filters went in, it was measuring somewhere around 49, but it was dropping. Every minute it went down a little bit more. That's why I thought, let me just waste two and a half gallons of RO water until it came all the way down. And then I let the system pressurize and push water into the DI. And I haven't even made a drop of DI water yet, but it's done. My next project that I worked on was something I had mentioned last week on the live stream. I said I needed somewhere to put the 832, which is the power brick for the Apex. I already have all my gear in place, but I needed to add another one, and I wanted a spot where I could put it, so I debated heavily where this should be located. I definitely didn't want it to be in my way, and when you put this anywhere, you're going to have wires running to it, so those wires could be in your way. Additionally, the... Uh, the risk was that water could splash this somehow against that wall. Right now I have almost all of my electrical in a power center that is sort of contained. You know, it's not waterproof, but it's pretty water resistant. And I wanted to make sure, <laughs> sorry guys, I, want, I even turned off notifications. Ah, you moderators quit talking to each other on Facebook. Um, I uh, was doing the... The, I was debating where to put this device, and finally I said, you know, I think I've got a spot that will stay dry, be underneath, and I thought, well, I'm going to have to build a board and screw it to the underside of my cabinet and keep it in place, and that concerned me. So I thought, because, you know, what if you put the screw too far and hit the tank, for example? What if it didn't screw on well enough and it just drops, you know, because and it would fall into the sump? So I thought, well, I need to put somewhere, and I noticed that the rails that are used on my steel stand can be um, that the walkboard slides into. Those rails are, there's like a, a place to put a hook. So I made this wooden gizmo out of three boards. I'm holding together my hand there just to give you a visual before I even started to screw and glue it together. And then, you know, I lined everything up and I went ahead and I pinned it with a pin nailer. And then I went ahead and put in some nice uh, exterior screws. And this needs to be painted. It's just raw wood. I just wanted to make sure it would fit. Now, the one thing I was not able to do was I was not able to put it on the pipe like I hoped because there's a lack of clearance above and you know the space above the pipe was barely two inches and the board was like two and an eighth so I had to make an L shape which you saw in that last picture I screwed on the mounting plate for the 832 onto the main board and then and now you can see it connected just to see how it looked and then I had to actually hold that board on the front and put the L shape behind it and then put the screws in right where you're seeing it now in the picture. So I basically had to screw two halves together to make it hold together. And then, you know, I could mount the 832 on there, which is great. And it's under the tank, it's in a very dry spot. And also the cords are going to reach where the, um, you know, from the different devices, dosing pumps, the new algae turf scrubber. I needed a place for all those wires to go. 
And then while I was at it, since I was already cutting up lumber, I thought, well, let me make a cute little holder for the Versa. And I kept thinking, oh, I'll make one out of acrylic, but <laughs> and I probably still will. Uh, but in the meantime, I said, let me just make something small out of this plywood I had handy. And I made this little holder. That's the little mounting strip that is used to hold the Versa in place. It's, uh, I guess you could say this was built sort of cantilever. And that way the, uh, the pump doesn't lean forward too much and fall forward or, or knock it over. So what we've got here is the Versa on its little stand. And then you can see in this picture, you've got the Versa on the stand on the edge of the sump. Let me see if I can open this up and move it down so you can see there. And then as we look up above, you can see the 832 with all the plugs. And the only thing that's not in this picture is you don't see the label maker. I put all the stickers on all those power bricks to know what each brick was just for ease of use in the future. If I have to unplug something, I'll unplug, you know, the Versa power supply. I won't have to chase the wire. I can just see the plug with the actual name on it. So I recommend that. And uh, so here is my 832 connected to the Apex. That was the next project I had to do. <laughs> I had to go ahead and plug it into the entire system. So it plugs in the wall to give it juice. And I had to hook up what looks like a USB wire. It's called an Aquabus cable. And I was able to use a very short three foot cable I had to reach from the 832 to a module that is used for my uh, auto top off, the ATK. So it basically daisy chained in because the ATK is wired to the apex. So by chain, you know, continuing the chain, you can keep adding more and more components. So once I got this all plugged in, then I had to just uh, label each outlet. And as you can see, the first two are taken by the turf scrubber. And when the turf scrubber is on, it uses, one's using 93 watts and one's using 98 watts. And then the next two are empty outlets for the moment. And then I have the dosing pump that is putting magnesium into the tank. I've got the power supply for the ATK, the Versa power supply, and then the pump for the AcroPower dosing. These are all on that new 832. And this is the backside of my wooden thing. So I still need to paint it. Uh, but in the meantime, this is going to work out really well. I think that's it. You might see my breakfast next. Nope. <laughs> I shared this picture last night. So this was at 2.30 in the morning. This is at 2.30 in the morning. And what you've got here is the algae turf scrubber is kind of glowing from its openings. And I'm running it 12 hours a day. So it's about to turn off in about three or four minutes. The one thing I didn't expect was the sound of the fans blowing. <laughs> uh, I was a little concerned about the sound of the water dripping, but that's not an issue. But the fans blowing is uh, notable in an open environment like my home. I'm told that when you just put inside a cabinet and close the doors, you won't notice it. I also don't feel a lot of heat coming off of it. It's just to keep the lights from overheating, but there's not like heat baking off of it. I put my hands in front of both. It wasn't even warm air. It was you know, slightly above temperature air, if that makes any kind of sense. And uh, then here it is still this morning. The lights had just come on. And uh, that's kind of where we're at as of right now. So I just wanted to kind of show you. I mean, there, I mean, I feel like I did like five or six projects over the last couple of days, plus work to fill all the orders from you guys that are needing things. And I was, uh, I've been working super hard to knock out orders as fast as I can for everyone. And you guys have uh, been great. I mean, I understand sometimes, you know, you need something right now and you understand that there's going to be some delay. Uh, sometimes it can go out the same day or the next day. Uh, that's a lot of the items in my shop are that way. But when it comes to building stuff, it takes a little time. And I've been knocking out stuff as best I could. And I'm actually doing <laughs> really, really, I'm really pleased to say that it's going really well. I uh, have uh, a handful of orders to work on for this next week. I've got to build a couple of sumps in the, co in the couple of weeks coming up. And I... Honestly, I mean, in my brain, I'm thinking, man, I am going to be doing some video editing very soon for you guys, you know, to get some stuff I've been wanting to share for some time. And that way I can start rolling out videos, man. It, in my brain, I'm thinking it'd be it would be so cool to like drop a video, drop a video, drop a video, drop a video. <laughs> and you're like, oh my God, why are all these videos coming at once? It's like, because I finally have caught up, you know, and, and I can do that. And since we're not going to events, I'm not traveling. And as a matter of fact, I'm trying to travel as little as possible. Uh, because, uh, not because of the, the sicknesses, because last year I, moved, I went everywhere. I did so many trips. I was just thinking, good. I mean, I never counted, but I seriously believe I did at least 16 trips last year. Probably more. And I was like, and I said, 2020, I'm going to travel less. 
So I've got uh, the next one that's on the books is to Oklahoma, but technically I could drive to that one if necessary uh, and to avoid any kind of contagion at the airport, you know, for example. I'm getting tons of emails from companies saying, you know, we really worry about coronavirus and your health and COVID-19. I mean, it's like companies like register.com that does the domain hosting. <laughs> I'm never going to make human contact with them. I mean, I, I barely email them and call them once every 10 years, but I'm getting notification that they are very serious about the, the uh, situation. And I guess basically what the, these companies are saying, because, you know, like I said, we're not touching them or anything. You know, I mean, that's completely electronic. If any of their employees are sick and services might uh, wane, they will they have plans to make sure that you know our service goes un uninterrupted and that's a valid point so we do want to uh, you know be aware that things could get a little tricky it could be a little difficult matter of fact think about this you know we've been talking about human quarantine but even products coming into the US from other countries I don't know how they're gonna do that I know for example uh, cobalt has a bunch of maxi jet pumps coming here from Italy and as we know from the news, Italy really got hit by that virus. So if the pumps arrive, what is customs going to do with a box or, or, or pallet, you know, pallets from Italy? What are they going to do? You know, what are they going to spray it all down, wipe it down, irradiate it with UV spectrum lighting? I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know if we have to wait even longer to get these maxi jets. Or, you know, uh, well... What about me? And I work with acrylic. What if my acrylic comes from China, which I don't know where it comes from. I don't think it does, but let's say it does. And with everyone sick over there, there's a chance production will drop. And what if I can't get acrylic to keep building things? We don't know what's going to happen. So we just have to kind of put our faith in uh, that it'll all work out. And uh, in the meantime, I'll tell you this. <laughs> I know there's going an uptick in the hobby. You know, despite you know, a lot of doom and gloom. When we are inside, we focus on our aquarium. When there's beautiful weather, we want to go outside. But now that we're avoiding certain things, sporting events, uh, 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 public uh, you know, concerts, whatever, you know, whatever it is that you normally go to, since a lot of those are being canceled or delayed or postponed or, you know, whatever, you're going to be at home and you'll probably be tinkering with your tank and your tank is going to do even better because you're paying more attention to it which is, you know, what we're supposed to be doing anyway, but a lot of times life gets in the way and we are uh, just kind of, I'll do it tomorrow, kind of an attitude. Uh, the turf scrubber just turned off, so it just got a lot quieter. I feel like 2020 is going to be the year I do the woodwork around the tank because I really do like the quiet. <laughs> and it'll it'll be pretty amazing with when I've got some wood around this tank. And plus, it'll be good to keep my grandson out of there when he comes to visit. Uh, there's no risk of him putting anything in the sump and uh, and harming the livestock. So that is uh, kind of where we are on those things. So now let's address some of the uh, topics that you... I'm just going to address these. <laughs> so I'm going to read them off to you and then we're going to uh, see what we can answer. Uh, the first person said, old school versus new school reefers. Uh, when it comes to that personality, <clears throat> I think what it is, <laughs> an old school reefer oftentimes is more jaded, less willing to try something new, uh, because what they've done has always worked, so why mess with success? And there is some truth to it, but as new gear comes out that makes reefing easier, there is a benefit to opening up, you know, the possibility of trying something new. I don't try a lot of new gear, but I do seem to go through two or three devices a year to see how they how they work, if I like them, if I want to sell them in my shop. And by doing so, you know, I can kind of answer questions that come up when people say, well, what do you think about this product or what do you think about that? And there's times where I just say, I don't know, I haven't tried it, I've never used it, I never needed it, and so I can't give you that information. But there's other stuff that, you know, it's, you know, the fleece rollers came out, you know, the turf scrubbers came out. Um, uh, lots of these different dosing pumps have come to market, so it's nice for me to get my hands on a few of those. But I think new school reefers 
they are so adamant about not adding anything to the tank that could possibly pollute or be a pest. And I think that is so overblown, and I think everyone needs to take a collective pause, take a breath, get some zen, relax, and appreciate that all those little bugs and worms that are in your tank are part of a natural ecosystem, and they all have a purpose. They all have a function. And to eliminate every last one of them, you know, just because it wiggles or moves doesn't mean it's evil. You don't have to burn it with fire. I think that that is a overreaction. Back in the day, people had big issues with destroying their tank with Kalkwasser. They'd constantly overdose their tank with Kalkwasser through an accident, through something going wrong. And because of that uh, risk, they kept losing their entire system. So when people say, oh, I've got amphipods and they're eating my zoanthids and I want them all gone, it's like, you know, they may be picking at the zoanthids. They may even be irritating some. Are they killing every zoanthid you own? Are they just getting a few of a certain polyp? Are they just cleaning the edge of one and the zoanthids uh, closed up? Can you dip the zoanthid and put it back in your tank and it's all well again? You know, I mean, I've got some zoanthids in here. And I've got amphipods, and I've got Asterina starfish, and I've seen the occasional Mahano, or I've seen, uh, you know, the, I have one or two Aptasia in my reef behind me that the copper band seems to totally ignore. I've encountered red bugs. I've encountered uh, red planaria flatworms. Um, I've had big, vicious crabs that eat fish <laughs> that just came in as a hitchhiker. I mean, it does happen over, the, you know, throughout my history of being in this hobby. But I've never once thought I must kill them all. The only worm that I want to eradicate from my tank was the what I call the orange worm, the Onini fulgida, which definitely is a meat eater and it's lightning fast, super hard to uh, to even look at because as soon as you put light, it's gone. It's gone like lightning. You have to sneak up on it with just a hint of light. Don't hit it with a light flashlight. As soon as it detects light, it's gone. And trying to grab it with uh, forceps, very hard to do because they're super slippery. And as you squeeze together, if there's just a few grains of sand between the forceps, the worm just slithers right through and escapes. And I had to remove those, and I was hunting them down for a while. Another thing that I had to hunt and remove were whelks. And those are just snails. They're in a shell. How hard is a snail to be captured? You just look for them, and you throw them away as fast as you find them. But... Uh, the rest of it, I just, it doesn't bother me. I don't worry about bristle worms. I don't worry about asterinas. You know, I saw the edge of one acro. There was an asterina. I was like, you know what? He ate some of that acro. But there's so much acro, it's like whatever. He had a nice meal. He's done. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't sit there and think that one's got to go. So that's the new mentality versus old school. I think that's an important one. You know, just kind of find some balance. Don't get too overreacted about it. <laughs> Um, we're going to stay on topic. The fragging and relocating of corals, please. So fragging is taking a piece of a colony and, uh, you know, taking a fragment of that coral is what we call fragging. And what we do is we trim it off one way or another. And it depends on the type of coral because there are soft corals that you could literally tear apart. Uh, like, for example, green star polyps, you can just tear a piece off. Zoanthids, you can tear a piece off. Uh, a leather coral, you can cut it with a razor blade. Uh, an SPS coral, you would cut with bone cutters. Um, a chalice or an acan, you might want to cut with a... Uh, well, there's different approaches to this one. But what I like to use a wet saw, which I have this big band saw that I pull out once a year, and I go to town and cut things off. You know, just use it once, put it, you know, clean it up, put it away, save it for another time. And it lets you do real precise cutting, and you can remove excess skeleton. So, for example, this spot right here in my tank, I have all these hammer corals, and I have the anemone. And there's a bunch of dead hammer coral skeletons right where the anemone just touches it all day long. And I was kind of thinking it would be, you know, it would be nice to remove those hammers and cut off the bottom and lower it, but. The wall of dead skeleton is keeping the anemone from going anywhere or touching anything or killing anything else. So in a way, I've allowed it to sacrifice whatever's going on so that the rest of the reef can stay safe. And the same goes for this big, huge chalice. People love this one right here. And there's a big section that I'm pointing to right there that is just dead skeleton with a little bit of coralline or whatever's on there. 
And people said, well, what happened to that part? And like, well, years ago, the anemone touched it and rubbed on it and killed it all. And after it was done, I thought, well, I'm not going to cut that away because now there's like this barrier of, let's call it dead rock. Then the anemone is like, okay, I don't want to touch it anymore. <laughs> it's too rough. It's not smooth and feels nice, nice like a chalice. So it's, it, um, I leave that barrier up. But if you are wanting to frag off dead parts of your tank, of your corals in your tank for aesthetics to make it look prettier, I totally recommend that. If you're trying to cut a piece of a coral and plant it elsewhere in the tank, that's a great thing to do. And people used to do that a lot. They'd buy a coral, they'd essentially break it in half and plant a piece here and plant a piece here. And they could basically double their odds of su success. And it would also kind of create more of a mixture in the reef tank because you saw uh, more, you didn't see like a green coral here and a blue coral here and an orange coral here. You saw the blue next to the orange and you saw a yellow polyped uh, leather over here next to uh, a green coral. And you could kind of divide and conquer and spread it out and kind of have more chances of it living. And then if you have something like the anemone come through and sting some, you still have others growing in the rest of the tank. So that is a nice thing to do. When you're cutting corals in your own tank and fragging and putting them somewhere else, placement isn't really going to be super critical. The coral's already used to your system and is used to your lighting. You know, you might put one lower than the other or you might put it up higher than the other, but they're kind of used to your system and they might have no issue whatsoever. If you take it from a super hot, bright, powerful spot and put it in a really dim spot, you know, odds are that the second piece isn't going to do as well. So you want to keep that in mind, but you know, putting pieces here and there is great. You can use coral glue. Cyanoacrylate is what we use, and some people buy it at the dollar store, super glue gel. Others buy stuff made for the hobby, like CG glue from Ecotech. Uh, Brightwell has a glue, Two Little Fishies has a glue. Um, Polyp Labs has a glue that I like a lot. Uh, they have these little individual tubes, and I buy a a grenade. It's a glue grenade. You pop the lid like you're opening a can of tennis balls and there's a whole bunch of little ones you can use a few at a time. You know, I mean use it up for a few corals and throw away the piece. I, I kind of like it. It's almost like a sampler size instead of having to use a big bottle. But at the same time I have bottles of glue. You know, you can just glue the coral in place. If you aren't using glue you can use putty to secure the coral in place. Or lastly you can put putty glue frag and let the frag glue to the putty and the putty shape to the rock. Now the one thing, I was talking to someone recently who was trying to glue something down and it wouldn't hold and he said, I don't know, what putty do you use because the putty I used didn't work. Well, it wasn't that the putty was wrong. The putty was probably totally fine. It was that he was taking a smooth rock and the disc, the frag disc was like a, like a circle and that was smooth and he put the putty between the two and expected it to stay and it was just coming off because there's zero traction. It basically needs to be roughed up or you need some kind of rough terrain so that the putty can get into the crevices and, and then kind of encircle and even like have fingers holding the frag plug. So you might have to use a few dots of uh, putty to secure something. When you are working with any kind of fragging, you want to avoid cutting yourself. You have to realize that you could get some kind of infection from anything in your tank, which includes the salt water, or it could be some kind of uh, slime coming off the coral. So you, if you have any open wounds, minimum a Band-Aid on it, uh, possibly hold off until your hand is completely intact again, or the rubber gloves. And then if you're submerging your hands on the tank, as soon as the glove fills with tank water, you've es essentially made yourself open to a possible infection. So you gotta take the glove off, rinse your hands, dry your hands again, put on a fresh glove. You know, I mean, it's just something you have to, you might go through a bunch of gloves during a session if you're dealing with that. You can glue the cut shut if you want with some super glue gel and maybe picking it off for the next week. That's another thing you can do. But we want to be cautious that we don't get any of any of the coral or water in our in our eyes or in our mouth or inside any open wounds on our hands. So watch out for that. And uh, Michael says, talk about UV sterilizers. UV sterilizers I've never used, not once. I've never seen the need. I just absolutely had no uh, reason to get it. However, I do think if someone really wants to use one, I think it'd be great for a quarantine tank because that's where you're putting in a fish that potentially is carrying a disease that it could release into the water and the UV could take care of it. But uh, I've just never had the need in my tank to run one. I do, you know, I've asked some questions over some, over, you know, the 
past couple of years to people and I've seen I've visited some tanks that had them I had to go to one tank and give them some advice because their tank was running super crazy hot and they couldn't understand why and they had a monster UV we had a pipe about this big around under the tank and they had all these fans going and they could not cool the tank and I just thought you know I think that UV is cooking the water it's so big it, it seems much too large for this size tank and the tank was like a 300 gallon but it just looked like that thing was rated for a thousand gallons <laughs> And I think that uh, there are times when maybe it doesn't have to run all the time. Like in that case, I told them, why don't you just run it 12 hours a day instead of 24? And you could run it during the, you know, the daytime when you're not in this room. And then in the evening, your tank is nice and quiet. The fans aren't running. The tank doesn't get so hot. Um, but some people like it because of clarity. The UV sterilizer will kill anything that goes through the UV sterilizer. It can't do anything to get rid of flatworms off your rock. It can't make your green hair algae suddenly vanish. It, it's not something that can, because it's not doing anything outside of the UV tube. So water's passing through. There is a light in there that is destroying good and bad bacteria. So if you're a dosing bacteria and you're running a UV sterilizer, you're killing it as fast as it pumps through. So if you have a 300 gallon an hour, 300 gallons an hour are being sterilized of any kind of bacteria, good and bad. Some people have tried to use it to fight dinoflagellates. Others have tried to use it to fight cyano. Uh, it's great for killing off an algae bloom. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it sounds like something you'd use occasionally. And like I said, I've, you know, I've been in this hobby since 97. So 23 years, and I've never have, ever had the urge to get one. Um, the next topic that was suggested or was requested I'd really like to know more, more about tank equipment, such as protein skimmers, what does it pull out, why do we need one, how to run a low-tech tank. <laughs> I just happen to be setting up a 120-gallon tank that can't be drilled. Weighing my options, not sure what can be used uh, to my best benefit. So I guess simply put reef chemistry, what we need to know, and how to manage it. Wow. So listen to every live stream I've ever done, because <laughs> I've talked about all of that. Uh, no, seriously. Watch the protein skimmer video. That one's good. It's going to teach you a lot about how they work and what they do and how to adjust them and how to clean them. And that one is a valid one. I run a skimmer on every tank I own. I would not run a tank without one. If I have to, I hate it. So I really do urge running one. It, is going, it basically is a great, huge safety net on your tank. It runs all the time. It drives off CO2, which is super beneficial to keeping pH up higher. And it collects fish waste. It also uh, collects impurities from the water. It's removing docks, which are dissolved organic compounds. So it can help somewhat in removing nitrate and phosphate. It's, I, wouldn't, I mean, my tank's full of nitrate and phosphate, so I'm not going to say the skimmer's doing it. <laughs> I'm just obviously feeding more than what it is pulling out because I love fat fish. Now, reef chemistry, I have an article. If you'll Google Mila's Reef, Water quality, you'll get that article. It's a huge article. Bookmark it, read it 10 times. Uh, it, it, it's exactly what you need to know when it comes to water chemistry. And uh, running a low-tech tank is definitely something that you can do. I've had people actually say, why don't you set up a simple tank? Why is everything got to be so expensive with you? And, uh, I mean, that's like asking someone, why do you drive that car? Why couldn't you just get the simple, cheap car? You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a chance I could go with a lesser choice. I choose what I like. I choose based on the quality of the brand, the people standing behind it, the warranty or customer service that I'm going to get. Um, and, the, you know, if I can't afford it, I can't afford it. I looked at getting a new calcium reactor a couple of years ago and I contacted several companies and I said, well, you know, I've been running this Life Reef calcium reactor for 15 years. So what's available now? What's different? How have they changed? How are they better? And, uh, you know, I kept hearing words or, you know, the uh, people m mumbling or muttering about, not muttering, that sounds negative. They kept bringing up Destaco. I was like, ooh, that sounds interesting. And it seems to be different than what I'm used to. And I want to know more about it. But it was way out of my price range. You know, it was like $2,000 and up. And I thought, no, I'm not going to spend that on a calcium reactor. So, you know, there are, I don't buy the absolute best of the best, but I do buy gear that I can run for years. And the MP60s on my tank were installed in 2011. It's nine years later. I'm still running the original motors. Uh, I did replace the drivers when they came out with the quiet drive, but that was just an upgrade. That wasn't a, uh, a need other than, you know, wanting it. But it wasn't like something broke. 
Uh, I have battery backups. I have to buy new batteries on those from time to time to keep those pumps running if there's a power outage. And I've had to buy a few wet sides over the last nine years. But I have zero regrets. I really like them. They're low profile. They provide lots of flow in the tank. And, uh, and there's no maintenance. It's just, you know, clean them occasionally. So I really like that. But low, pro, uh, low maintenance or uh, what does she call it? Uh, low, low tech tank. I did run a 29 gallon and a 55 gallon initially with hang on back overflow boxes, which were not drilled tanks. And the downside of that is that every single day you need to check on your overflow box to make sure it's operating correctly. It's not a lot of work. You just look at it <laughs> for, you know, five seconds and say, yep, yeah, that looks good and go on with your day. But if the YouTube on the top has a big air pocket, you need to stop what you're doing and correct that. You need to basically suck out that air so that it's pure water going through the tube because you don't want it to break the siphon or slow down so much that the return pump is pushing in water faster than the tank can drain due to that U-tube not being running at a full efficiency. So you have to look. And if you don't look at it, if you ignore it, you're going to run into problems. And what if the tank overflows, a little bit of water runs down the sides, will that water hit anything electrical and stop the breaker, you know, trip the breaker and stop the power to the tank and kill everything you want? I mean, that is the absolute worst case scenario, right? But other than that, hang on, tack, uh, hang on tank overflow boxes or HOB overflow boxes are fine. You can drill your tank yourself. If it's full of livestock, you probably don't want to. But if it's not full of livestock yet, now is the perfect time to drill it. I do build overflow boxes that you can silicone inside the tank. Uh, I make them whatever size you need them to be to fit your tank, and I do those every single week. So if that's something you want to do to kind of give yourself a little bit more of a a perk with your new setup, I would recommend it. You can use cheaper test kits. You don't have to, you know, buy automated testing machines for $800 or $1,000. You know, so that's more low tech. And there's nothing wrong with that. I tell everyone to use test kits every Saturday. Today is water test Saturday. Um, salt mixes, pricing ranges from, you know, cheap salt all the way up to imported from Germany salt. So you just have to pick what you like. Uh, power heads, you can choose to buy whatever you want to buy. Uh, like I said, I choose to buy things that I feel have uh, really good longevity. And you'll, the funny thing is, I see people always saying, oh, I had that pump and it was terrible and I was causing a problem. And I, was... <sighs> I always wonder what's different. Why is their power head different than mine if it's the same brand? You know, what changed? And I almost wonder, you know, I don't want to sit there and nitpick them to death to get the answer, but I wonder if they bought it used and it didn't hold up, and of course it was out of warranty and they were not the original owner, and then they're upset that it didn't work as good, and they expect it to be worth so much more because originally that pump was 450 bucks or something. It's like, well, I mean, you bought used. I have bought lots of new pumps over the years. I have I bought sequence pumps several times for return pumps, and I kept buying seals. Matter of fact, sequence uh, would make the reflow dart pump, and if you had a seal failure, you could contact them and they'd send you new seals. And so I did. I said, hey, I need a couple new seals. They said, no problem. What's your address? And then I said, I want you to send me two more. And they said, no, we only give you two. I said, like, I'm not asking you to give me. Sell me seals. And they said, why? I said, because I'm going to install these. And then when these fail, I want two in my you know, utility drawer ready to go. So that way, when this happens on Friday night and you're closed until Monday, I'm not without a pump for three days. Or that I have to let it keep leaking for three more days because you know, I have a bad seal. And they just thought that was the weirdest request. <laughs> and for me, having everything under my roof that my tank needs is how I run my hobby. Just like I own a generator where I can go outside and I can pull on a rope and I can start providing electricity if the city stops providing it due to a storm or an accident. And I don't rely on, well, power will come on eventually. You know, I want to have a backup system. And when it comes to, I mean... I have a very expensive pump, that's my return pump on my, on my sump, you know, pushing up into this 400 gallon tank. And I bought an external additional pump in case I might need one, one day, while that's being resolved. Because, you know, the Abyss pump has a 10 year warranty. So in theory it could be fixed, but what if it's down for two or three weeks while it's getting fixed? I still gotta move water up to the tank, I can't let the tank wait for three weeks. So I bought a brand new pump. I looked at it, looks great. I wrapped it up in basically a, a shrink wrap so it, no moisture can get in it, put it back in the box and put it in my back room where I store everything from my aquarium so that if and when I have a problem, I can just go in there and get that pump and install it 
and continue moving flow through the tank. Um, and then the rest of it's really just acquiring things. You can, you know, like if you're buying salt by the bucket, you will acquire buckets. <laughs> uh, I do think you should have a trash can to mix salt water in, one that's only for salt water, nothing else. It's constantly clean. These are all low tech solutions, you know, sponges and scrubbies and things like that, you know, the uh, magic eraser. You don't have to spend a ton. And when it comes to lighting, that's usually going to be one of your most expensive items, I would think. And so you want to find something on the market that is doing well. And I would suggest looking at people's tanks and saying, what lights are you running? to decide what you want to buy. Uh, you, uh, it seems like everyone looks at Radeon as the best light you could buy. You know, like it's the pinnacle. I think Geisman is more expensive than Radeon. And uh, Geisman is also made in Germany. Or Israel, maybe. Maybe it's Israel. Uh, and those lights are very expensive, yet people buy them. They love them. <laughs> but there's others that have bought stuff that was uh, imported from China. It's cheap. And they made it work. You know, Dwayne's Beautiful Reef. He had a whole bunch of those uh, black boxes over this tank, you know, had no name. And he ran those at 100% on every channel, every single day. He didn't even adjust them down. Everything's 100%. And they were about this far off the water, I think. And every single year he took one light fixture, well, he took all the light fixtures down and removed every single diode, every LED was removed, and he soldered in brand new ones, and it took him whatever it took him. I don't know if it took him minutes or hours to do that. But he had to do it every single year with every single light fixture. And that way, every year, he had brand new light on his tank. And finally, he was sick of it. And he's like, I've been doing this for years. I'm so tired of soldering on these brand new LEDs. So he bought some Radeons. And he got them used. <laughs> so he still is saving some money. But uh, I do like the Radeon lights. And the new Gen 5s came out. And they're starting to go out. Uh, I mean, people are buying, get, receiving them. And I ordered one myself for my frag tank. It hasn't arrived yet. It'll probably be here the end of the month, maybe, or early April. We'll see. And I'm looking forward to seeing it next to the uh, the other one, that the, the previous generation that's hanging that will be hanging to its right. So we'll find out about that. Um, talked about that. Uh, Paul says, "Where and uh, what's the best way to buy livestock that's been pre-quarantined?" There's uh, not a lot of companies that do that. Some do. And like seed dwelling creatures, for example, when they bring in their new livestock, they actually have an entire room that is medicated for everything before it goes into the main system for all the buyers, which is going to be all the fish stores across the nation to get their livestock from. So I've been there. I've seen the protein skim rows super tall, like as tall as my ceiling, maybe taller. And all the water in the, uh, the protein skim was green. It was crazy. I mean, it wasn't like algae, it was like green water, and you could see every, all the little troughs that had stuff in it, everything was green, so it was maybe these malachite green or something like that. Is there such a thing? I know it was malachite blue. <laughs> I don't know, it might have been a formalin. <clears throat> but whatever it is, they, they were medicating. Uh, Live Aquaria Diver's Den quarantines everything for three weeks before it is even made available to purchase. And their stuff costs more, but it's been through that screening, and you get the 14-day live guarantee which is really good. Uh, some, some very few fish stores do some quarantining before you can buy from them, and that's nice. And then lastly, you can quarantine. You can set up a quarantine tank yourself and not expect people to do it for you. So there is that. And you know, I, everything, every fish I get goes through safety stop, and every coral I get gets put through a coral dip. But uh, the best case is then after you're done dipping and uh, the safety stop bath, is put those into a quarantine tank for a few weeks for observation and then move it into your reef. That's the best practice. I have been lax in doing quarantining. Uh, I've been doing the bath, which is a two hour process, and the dip, which is a 15 minute process. And I've been doing that for years. But uh, at some point I'm gonna have to quarantine just so I can do a video about it. <laughs> I have no choice. I'm gonna have to find a spot, lose, you know, I hate making my fish room smaller and smaller, putting things in. I'm halfway tempted to just put the little tank right here in the living room. So I'd have the quarantine tank right here, and then I'd have my reef over here, and that way I could actually observe it while I'm here in the living room and working at the desk or building things on the table. I'd have a, a visibility right here of how it's doing. I could feed it all the time. <laughs> I could make sure it's okay, and then you know, eventually it gets moved over. You know, I could do that. I just I would have to sacrifice this corner, and I'd have to make sure there's electricity over here to plug in the nine things that tank's gonna need. Eh, it's probably not nine. It doesn't need a light. It's going to need a heater. It's going to need some kind of a filter. 
Um, and it needs some kind of flow, a little bit. Even if it's an air stone, so that's an air pump that's plug in. Something's got to plug in. So I got to put a few more things here. And, uh, you know, it, and it's another tank I have to keep clean. <laughs> so. Um, Drew has been asking me about a video that I have not watched yet uh, about in-depth coral chemistry. He is the chemist. I am not. And I haven't had a chance to watch that one yet. I've literally, you know, only... I feel like I've been working around the clock. It's, uh... My day is different than most people's. You know, most people start and work at 8 o'clock and work till 5. And I tend, you know, I've been telling people for a long time, I get up at the crack of noon, which isn't really true anymore. I get up at 10.30. <laughs> and then for the first couple hours, I'm in a lot of pain. Uh, I do stretches. I, uh... I do ice packs, I take a hot shower that blasts my back, you know, I take pills, and then by noon I am at it working. And then I pretty much work all the way through to almost midnight. And then, you know, I have a couple hours to kind of wind down and then I'm back to sleep. And that is my schedule. <laughs> so uh, whether I'm answering phone calls or I'm building things or I'm answering messages, however they come in through Instagram, through Facebook, through text, uh, I don't even know what else. I mean, I'm constantly being reached out to and I do my and emails, of course, too. So I'm always trying to address all these things. And with that, it makes it tough to squeeze in other things. But, uh, you know, there, that is one topic I have not had a chance to, to watch yet, Drew, and I will. I, I know you've mentioned several times. Uh, I think you're doing it and you're loving it. So I, I think that's why you're pushing it my direction. I just haven't had a chance. Uh, <laughs> one person said, what haven't you spoken about when he was talking about what we should discuss on the live stream? Uh, oh, by the way, one guy sent me a message on Instagram yesterday and he said that he was watching my streams back to back and he was already 14 hours in. I was like, wow. I mean, that's only like four streams. <laughs> um... Oh, another thing I did this week that I didn't mention is I replaced the reagents in my Trident, which is not just a simple, you know, swap and done. There's actually a little routine to it. You gotta make sure everything's right. So that was one more thing I had to do in my tank. I, I feel like I really babysit the tank a lot today between everything else. Several people asked me to talk about dinoflagellates. And I keep telling you, I, I, just, I don't, haven't done a video on that because I haven't had like the full-blown disaster tank that some people struggle with. When I saw a little hint of it, I dealt with it quickly before it could get out of control. And my main approach was to remove it from my system as quickly as possible, literally, manually siphoning. The, uh, if you try to use a chemical to solve that one, or you try water changes, or you, tr I mean, you know, basically you're doing everything except get your hand wet. <laughs> it just seems to grow abundantly out of control it gets worse and worse and then you're you're losing your mind and then you're at the point where you just want to get rid of your tank because you can't solve it where i had some of it coming off of a coral i had a big gorgonian i brought home from florida and i took the gorgonian out and i put it in a bucket of tank water and i swished it around until all of it came off the coral and i put the coral back in the tank and the next day it was on there again and i swirled it again i did it for two or three days and i was thinking i'm going to kill this coral you know because how much can i handle this thing before it finally says, I give up, I die. But fortunately, it didn't. It, I had it for a long time. But I was able to eliminate it off of that one particular coral. If it was on your sand, I would basically kill all the pumps in the tank so that there's no flow, and I would shovel it all together somehow with a credit card or a Kent scraper or whatever it is you got to make a pile, and then I would take a hose and I would siphon out that pile to eliminate it from the system. If it's on the glass, I would scrape upward with a credit card, and I would take that credit card and the goo and rinse it in a bowl of water and scrape some more. I mean, I would do what I could to manually remove as much as I could. I have tried the method of using 3% uh, peroxide in my tank, where you use one milliliter per 10 gallons of water. So if you have a 100 gallon tank, you need 10 milliliters, and you do that for eight days in a row. You just put it in the tank and it's supposed to knock them out. But uh, others have tried two milliliters and three milliliters for 10 gallons and still had to struggle. And I think it's because they had too much of it in the system. If you can maintain a tank pH of 8.5 all the time, that can help get rid of it. If you stop feeding the tank, that doesn't necessarily get rid of it. Running a UV can help if the stuff goes through the UV, but uh, it 
again, you still have the bubbly stuff coming off the rock and coming off the sand and coming off the corals. And it's stringy, it's gooey. I mean, it, when you look at it, it basically, the first description most people call it is it looks like snot. And it, you know, it can be in different colors. It can be brown, it can be green. It's gross. And uh, it just, and it's really toxic. Nothing wants to eat it. Snails seem to touch it and die. Fish avoid it. You know, they're just generally miserable. So I just uh, take the approach of cleaning it. Water changes fuel it. <laughs> so if you sit there and do a big water change, whatever that stuff needs or thrives on, the brand new salt water brings it even more strength. So that's not a good approach. Um, I'm all about manual removal. Just like when you know, people say I have this algae problem and I'm like, where's your cleanup crew? And you know, no one ever buys enough cleanup crew. And I always mention that. And so if you don't wanna buy a cleanup crew, if you don't wanna spend the money, it's too expensive, then you are the cleanup crew and you have to go and do all the cleaning. It's your job because you won't hire someone else to do it. Just like your house. You can have a cleaning crew that cleans your house once a week or once a month, or you can clean it yourself. And it's the exact same thing with your tank. The tank does not stay clean naturally. If you go swim in any reef in the ocean, it's not clean. <laughs> there's algae everywhere. And the fish are eating some of it, and the hermits are picking at it, and yeah, but there's algae. And we like these pristine tanks because we've seen some examples and we're like, oh, so blown away. But those people really clean the tank or they uh, have a huge cleanup crew that's doing the cleaning for them. So you have to choose what you want to do. Um, one person said, what about sump maintenance and getting the most out of your refugium? So sump maintenance would be for me is to clean it, to actually wipe it down, use, you know, again, I use credit cards for everything. I mean, I just have a stack of anything, hotel key cards, gift cards, whatever, as soon as they're no longer valid or usable, they are now mine to use in my tank. And I use them to scrape the inner walls of my sump because it won't scratch the acrylic. I will scrape the bottom if there's anything down there. I like to vacuum out the mess that uh, that accumulates, the detritus. Uh, there was a speaker years ago that came to our, uh, came. we had an event here in our club called Next Wave. And we had three or four speakers each, you know, every time we had that event. And this one speaker talked about all the detritus in the sump and she loved it. <laughs> she says, don't get rid of that. Look at it, it's full of bugs, it's full of life. Why would you remove that? And I thought, wow, I've never heard anyone say that before. And you know, I mean, I understand where she's coming from. And at the same time, a lot of people like a clean sump. So you have to choose what's best for you. If you like a lot of stuff down there, so be it. You realize that if you do a water change and you pump water in, you're gonna kick up a huge dust storm that's gonna pump into your tank and make a mess. So that's no fun. And uh, a lot of people run filter socks because it's supposed to catch everything in the first place and trap it within the mesh. And if you do that, then essentially your sump should stay pretty clean all the time as long as you're staying on top of it and you don't allow them to overflow into the sump. Others don't use socks at all. They might be using some kind of uh, fleece roller or they use uh, some kind of fleece pad where it maybe drips through or flows over and then continues. And if you're doing anything like that, you might still see some detritus in the sump. And so using that vacuum attachment I sell that's from VCA, it hooks up to a maxi jet that's awesome. You can just pump it right out into a nearby bucket and you know your the hose diameter is maybe three eighths so you're not losing a lot of water and you can just pump you know pump out all the crud off the bottom of your sump now it looks nice and clean again add some more salt water to make up what you lost and uh, you have a nice clean sump and plus wiping everything down lets you see the gear when you first set up your tank you put in all that gear and you're kind of proud of it i mean you're like man look at this it's gorgeous and everything's exactly where it belongs and it cost me all this money and I want to show it off. And you know, it, you know, we're all like, man, that looks amazing, congratulations. And in my head, I'm thinking, don't get it wet. <laughs> I mean, you have to. But once you get it wet, it's gonna start getting dirty. And then it comes down to your job of cleaning. And so I do recommend once a year, you know, minimum, once a year, clean the entire thing inside and out. One friend of mine actually would remove his entire sump, take it outside and blast it with a hose and bring it back in. Um, I, he's the only guy I've known that's ever done that. I, I knew one guy up in uh, Seattle who would, he had a huge sump, but it was in his garage. It was adjacent to the tank, so it wasn't uh, gonna affect the tank. And he would clean that thing meticulously. And he came in with a garden hose to clean zone after zone until it was completely clean and flushed through the floor drain. And that was really cool, but he actually was so OCD about that clean system that he would challenge anyone in the local area to show up any time to do a spot inspection and he dared them to find a dirty sump because it was never going to happen, and it never did. He, 
he loved everything being pristine and brand new. Just like, you know, if you went into a jewelry store to buy diamonds, for example, let's say you're looking for an engagement ring or a wedding ring. If you saw dust on the cabinets, you would think, why am I here? What happened? Everything is pristine in there. Everything is wiped down. Everything is glittering. And, you know, obviously we're not going to have our systems look like that. But when you wipe everything down and there's no salt creep, there's no weird film, uh, there's no, uh, you know, drips and spatters, you can see what's going on inside. You can tell if a reactor isn't running right or if something isn't flowing right. Uh, you just spot the errors, which is so important because we want to make sure that everything stays just right. So I would definitely recommend doing that. And, you know, you, some people have taken a shop vac instead of that little vacuum attachment. I love that vacuum attachment. I probably use it three, four times a year now. And, you know, it's a $10 part. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's nothing. It's a nothing. Why would I buy a shop vac? I'm going to be pumping out. Think about shop vacs and how much water they pull out as they are, you know, you're trying to get detritus out of the bottom of your sump. It sucks it out super fast. You're going to run out of water and then you're going to be trying to suck up sludge. Yeah, maybe that works. I don't know. I choose not to do that. Uh, I really like to just address an area at a time, clean it out nice, scrape it all clean. And I work on this sump probably every couple of months, maybe even once a month. I mean, they're wiping things down. So, and I'm always cleaning the top edge. And then he also said, uh, getting the most out of your refugium. Well, don't run the lights too long. I think that a lot of people make that mistake. Uh, make sure there's enough plants in there in the first place. If you're starting with just a little tiny nothing, you don't have enough. I would put in more, get more algae from other people or buy it online and, you know, get, instead of buying one, buy three or four. So you get a clump. Um, your tank has to have nutrients. Don't put, don't set up the refugium before your tank is established. There's zero benefit in setting it up during the cycle. There's so little benefit after the cycle. I would wait months to finally get the refugium zone going only because there's, you need a bioload. You need to be feeding. You've got to have fish. You've got to have corals. You've got to poop. You know, all that stuff's got to be in the water so that the plants can absorb the nutrients because if your tank is nutrient-free, how are the plants going to survive? they got nothing to feed on. All right. Um, another person asked about talking about amino acids, and that would be something I'd have to actually do homework on. I have, I'm running amino acids in my tank, and I've run it in the past, and I really didn't see much of a difference. But there's people that swear by them. And uh, they'll, you know, for example, they use Acropower. That's a well-known amino acid. And people are just, like, using the heck out of it. So when I talked to Julian Sprung directly and said to him, you know, what's the deal with amino acids? He, he looked me right in the eye and he said, 50% of the people will tell you they love them and they won't run a tank without them. And 50% will say they can't tell a difference. <laughs> and I was like, swell. So it, it, like, it's a 50-50 type situation. Now, he told me that years ago, maybe things have changed since then. We are getting way more in tune with our tanks with ICP testing. And, uh, but, you know, it's back in the day, it was often recommended, don't put anything in your tank you can't test for. And there's so much stuff we put in our tanks these days that we can't test for. Or maybe we can with ICP, I don't know. But uh, it's hard to know for a fact what's what. And so sometimes you just have to realize when you're putting something in your tank, it might take 8 to 12 weeks before you notice a difference. And then you have to decide, do I want to keep doing it? Or do you want to stop doing it and see if the tank changes for this, you know, basically going south, it's not doing well. Then you can say, okay, yeah, those, those made a difference. I'm going to go back to using them. You know, uh, as far as I recall from what limited knowledge I have about amino acids, you could dose it in the tank. And I think, I might have this mixed up, but I think I remember that it would elicit a feeding response. And then when you put the food in the tank, the coral's already ready. Uh, that being said, I'm only dosing amino acids in my tank once a week. So it has no bearing on feeding response whatsoever. I'm just doing it because I had a gallon of the stuff sitting here forever. And, you know, why not just use it? So I hooked it up to a dosing pump. And last night while I was doing all that new stuff under the tank, I was syncing my Camor pump with my phone. And I noticed that it said that the container was empty, you know, that the, the liquid I had left was empty, but it wasn't. And I'm wondering if it stopped dosing because it thought the bottle was empty. And maybe there's a built-in, I don't know. I've never heard anyone mention it, but, you know, I tell it dose every Friday, dose in 90 milliliters. And I'm wondering if it hasn't for like the last week or two because it thought it ran out, even though there's about 200 milliliters left in the jug, which is like two more weeks. 
So I set it to 200 milliliters and I'll let it uh, use some more and see what happens. But that was kind of a weird one. <clears throat> but I don't know enough. I was actually wondering this. You know, I keep talking about Coral Magazine. They have been doing so many articles for so long. I was wondering if there is, and there might be. I haven't even looked. It was just something that popped in my head. I wonder if there's a way to search maybe the Coral Magazine website for articles on a certain topic and then find all the issues that mentioned it. I wonder if they do that. <laughs> I mean, probably they do, and I'm the... I'm finally realizing I could do that. I'm more, you know, it's like you get a magazine from any company, you read the magazine and then you're done with it. You either toss it, recycle it, or you save it. And, you know, I save it like part of my library and that's why I have so many issues. But I've never thought about going back to an issue. <laughs> it's just, I always move forward. So I was wondering, oh, what if I could look up amino acids on the Coral Magazine website or through some kind of search engine and find out what issues and go find those issues and read those articles again. So it's something that's on my list of things to do this week. Um, uh, Brian suggested that we should discuss important fish tank related items to have on hand or things to prepare in order to keep your reef running smoothly during times of natural disasters or crisis or national emergencies. So, and he said, you know, it's a relevant topic given what's going on. You know, now that we've run out of toilet paper, <laughs> the big concern is what are we going to run out that our tank needs? You know, and you know, like I said, for me, my concern is products that come out of countries that are not allowed to come into our country temporarily. You know, whether it's pumps, powerheads, plastic bottles, float valves, um, electronics, I don't know, I mean, whatever. The things we rely on, what if we can't get those things for the next three to six months? How are we going to keep our tank running? You know, I, uh, I mean, it could be anything. It could be the smallest, most mundane thing. But we want to make sure we have enough stuff on hand. So what do you need in an emergency is power and uh, oxygen. Those are the two really important ones. And then if you're in a cold area, heat. And if you're in a hot area, cool. <laughs> so you got to have a way to keep the tank temperature stable. Uh, but, you know, we're, we did a whole live stream on emergency tank care, so I'm not going to, you know, dwell on all that. But things to have on hand would be plenty of food for the foreseeable future. You know, if, if you have flake food, pellet food, you're probably good for months. Uh, frozen food, you know, you could stock up a little bit extra if you felt that there was a concern that you wouldn't be able to get some from a local fish store. Not everything can be ordered online and received in a day or two. Certain things are becoming back-ordered items. I've been trying to get heaters in for months. I've been trying to get maxi jets in for months. I uh, reached... Oh, I hate saying this. I, well, I reached out to find out where my next uh, order of reagents is coming for the Trident, and there's a delay on that one. So, but, I mean, all the orders that people placed got their order. <laughs> so that's great. No one's waiting, but... And my website says out of stock. So anyone that buys it now is making a mistake. <laughs> uh, usually it's like it's going to be here in the next week or two and, you know, it continues. So if you place an order, it's no problem. But now, because of what's going on in China, I'm a little worried about stuff coming in. The reagents don't come from China, but the plastic bottles probably do. And, you know, if we can't get those bottles... I was wondering, should we take our little bottles and send them back to Neptune so they can reuse them so they're not wasted? But, you know, the cost of shipping and and disinfecting those and getting them ready again. I don't know. So, but I mean, it's again, one more thing we're waiting on. There's other stuff I've been waiting on for months. And it hasn't shown up yet. I'm like, man. So I get it. Things like that. But, uh, yeah, that's pretty, I mean, you know, when you're thinking about national emergencies or even local emergencies, it's it, usually the biggest emergency is a lack of power. That's usually the biggest fear for our tank. So you want to make sure you're prepared for that. Um, <laughs> the topic of flatworms was another one that was requested. So we did an entire video about flatworms a few, probably a month ago, a month and a half ago. And I just want to reiterate that if you are treating your tank for flatworms, you absolutely must be on top of it. You can't just put some in today and then go to bed, you know, some product, and then go to bed and then the next day say to me, should I do a water change? Because at this point, you are already way too late. The uh, chemical is super fast acting. It's uh, really aggressive to the livestock, to, to the flatworms. 
And as they die, they release uh, ammonia into the water, which can cause a cascading effect. So if you are going to treat your tank for flatworms, you need to be ready within 15 minutes to do a massive water change, start running carbon, get the skimmer going, and you should be siphoning out the ones dying during the 15 minute treatment. Uh, it, you have to be on top. That's a, I have a whole article about this on my website. You must read that. You must follow those directions. Uh, and, and that's my approach of dosing. Flatworm exit to my tank and it worked. I didn't lose anything. But there were so many people that lost fish, lost corals, you know, lost you know, mostly fish. And it's because the flatworms die and they release this ammonia, which causes a cycle. And the cycle, of course, is toxic to everything in the tank. And you start losing all kinds of stuff. And you've got to know what you're doing before you put a drop in your tank. Matter of fact, I tell people, siphon out as many as you can see every single day for 14 days. Just keep siphoning them out to reduce the population until you only have like a handful left. And then at that point, treat your tank because only a few are left. Even if they die, you know, it, it, there's going to be a less ammonia hitting the water. But it, the medicine's not the risk. Um, Ryan said, fish, he'd like to know about a fish's, <laughs> fish's, a fish's true diet and what foods improve their overall health compared to others. That's a good one because a lot of times we like to use something we like. <laughs> And we want to make sure that we have a balanced diet. Like, for example, if you have a fish that is normally a herbivore and you're constantly given an omnivore diet, that fish is lacking what it needs. And that was basically the impression that we believe my coltang wasn't getting enough veggies. And that's why the weird holes around the head, because none of the other tangs have it. And so I started using more and more nori. And uh, I haven't really seen a solution, but it might take forever to heal or it may never heal. I don't know. But... Having, knowing what that fish normally eats in nature is the first step. And then studying the foods you have and finding out which ones are right. And you know, when you feed, you can do things like you can use Formula One, which was a omnivore diet for Monday, and then you can use herbivore diet for Tuesday, and you can cycle back and forth if you want. Or you can put a little bit of each combined and put that in the tank so that this fish likes greens and this fish likes reds they can go get them you know and they they'll pick what they like when i do my frozen foods every single night i mix up multiple frozen foods so that everyone has a choice of what they want to eat and what size of food they want to eat and this goes from fish eggs all the way up to krill and so there's you know stuff for the big fish like spock to go chew and shred and then i've got a uh, bite size a little mini mysis that the copper band slurps up through her, her little snout. So you have a, a selection or choice of foods. So I would do that. But if you're just saying, well, I just want to use this one flake food. I don't want to spend any more money. You may be cheating something out of its normal diet. Uh, angelfish, for example, like sponge. And you can't just go buy a sponge and put it in the tank and let that angel eat it. That's not going to solve it. But there are foods you can buy that are frozen that have sponge included so that the angel is getting what it needs. For example. Um, and then finally, the last one that was requested for today was to talk about tangs and other fish aggression. When you're setting up a tank and you have this desire to have fish, you have to choose, a, you have to make a list. I want to have these fish. And then a lot of times people will post that list. And they'll go to somewhere like, say, Club Milo's Reef. And they will say, hey, I'm thinking about getting these five tangs two clowns, a pseudochromus, a flame angel, a copper band, a mandarin, you know, and, and they say, and, you know, what do you guys think? And then the first question we're going to say is, what size tank? <laughs> and then we're going to say, you know, how long have you been in the hobby? And, you know, we're just going to try to get a sense of who you are and what you do. And then we want to go ahead and we want to uh, figure out which fish will get along with what. And there are some fish that are not compatible with others. So you don't necessarily want to put <coughs> uh, different fish that, like, for example, we don't put aggressive fish in a reef because they will kill things we care about. I have seen aggressive-only tanks where they're all aggressive, and yet they will damage each other. I went to visit this one person a decade ago, and he had a puffer, and he had, you know, uh, some kind of an eel, and he had... I don't know, I feel like there was a big old tang in there, you know, which was big and needed a big swimming area, but the lower jaw was gone. And I said, what happened to that fish? It just had a, a beak, you know? 
and they said that the fish had grabbed some food and the puffer saw it and with its beak took the food and the lower jaw of that tang away. The tang was still alive, was still finding a way to eat food, but man, what a way to live. So you want to keep in mind what can live with what or what should not be together. Uh, putting a, you know, like for example, I had a porcupine puffer. I put it in my frag tank. It was really cute. Someone was moving and said, Mark, I want you to take care of it because I know you'll do a good job. And I thought, well, I don't want to put it in my reef. I've seen them in reefs, but I didn't want to put it in my reef. It was a porcupine. It was, it was cute. But it ate a clownfish and it didn't eat the tail section. It ate the head and left the tail, you know, the, the second half of the clown on the gravel. So I named it Murderer and I gave it away because <laughs> I was not happy with that. You know, I, I was happy to let it live in there and do its thing. And if it messed with the coral, I didn't care and I was going to feed it. But when it was murdering my fish, yeah, not going to work. So fish aggression is an important thing. Usually if you know a fish on your list is going to be aggressive, if it's a well-known aggressive fish, you put it in the tank last. Uh, the Sohal tang is aggressive. A purple tang can be aggressive. Um, the Atlantic blue tang, which gets to be really big, very aggressive. Um, so you don't want to put those in your tank in the beginning because then you can't add anything else. Every time you try and put something in there, it's going to be attacked and it could break out in a disease or it could just be murdered. So you want to put the aggressive one last. If you have an aggressive fish and you still want to add more fish, you could remove the aggressive fish and put it down in the sump for a couple of days or put it in a quarantine or hospital tank for a week or two add the new fish and then put it back in. Another trick is you can rearrange the rock work. You may not like the sound of that, but when you do rearrange the rock work, you've changed all the territories. And when that fish comes back in, it doesn't have its neighborhood, you know, that it's used to defending. And so it's, it's, it, the dynamic has changed in the tank and you can kind of overcome it that way. I sell the peacemaker for new introductions of fish to where, so when you get a brand new fish and you quarantine, oh, I'm sorry, and you, uh, you bring it home and you acclimate it, it's super stressed. I mean, that tank, that fish was in a tank at the fish store and it was scooped out with a net and dropped in a bag and then they, you know, add some air to the bag and they twist the bag and the fish is just kind of in this vortex of water and it seems okay, you know, but it's stressed and it's releasing a stress hormone in the water. And if you come home and acclimate and you're opening the bag and you're pouring water in the fish is spooked every time you do it. I mean, it just happens. That's just, I mean, there's no ifs, ands, or buts. That's what happens. So it's still stressed. And then you've acclimated it and you're like, okay, I'm gonna put it in the tank. You know, it's been, you know, 45 minutes. It's been an hour and a half, whatever it is you did. I really recommend shorter uh, acclimation, not hour and a half, two hours, three hours. That's way too slow uh, for, for most fish. Um, but side note, if you're gonna acclimate slowly, add an air stone and add a heater to maintain temperature and oxygen the entire time. That way it's just sitting in a body of water, but don't leave it in there too long. Okay. So now you've got this acclimated fish. You're ready to put in your tank. It's super stressed. You put it in the stress hormone hits the water and all the fish go into aggressive mode. They're all like, something's not right. I can sense it. There's a disturbance in the force. What happened? What's different? What I got to do to solve it. And they get really mean. So you want to look at re reducing that stress hormone. So with me, I bring home the fish. I put it through safety stop, which is a two hour bath, you know, 45 minutes, 45 minutes. And then, you know, well, it's acclimate for 20, 45, 45. So it's about two hours. Now it's going into the peacemaker box. And so I put the peacemaker right there in my tank and I put the fish in there, stress hormones and all, and it's just in there. And I put a lid on top so it can't jump out and it stays there for three days. The stress hormone hits the water, the reef kind of swims around like what the hell's going on, but no one can do anything because nothing's different other than there's some guy up in a box, but they can't touch it. And after three days, I can pour it in the tank and I have zero aggression. Every single fish I put in my tank over the last five or six years has had no aggression problems whatsoever. I didn't see anyone chasing, squabbling, or fighting. The uh, only two fish that do squabble mainly are the two yellows, and they were like that from the first day I got them and I got them together put them in the tank and they have been frickin' frack ever since. That's their names. <laughs> and it's, there's, I'm thinking about removing one and putting it in the frag tank just to maybe stop even that little bit of chasing because it bothers me. So that is everything I had to talk about today, guys. So now we're going to go to the question and answer part. 
Uh, I'm going to scroll back through all these comments. I've been seeing a lot of stuff in there. I've been ignoring it to stay on topics. But I want to answer your questions. So please, if you haven't already, do at Milo's Reef and then write your question. Um, if you are asking the same question 10 times, that doesn't make me see it better. It means I'm going to see it 10 times now that I'm finally looking at the chat. And if you've asked a question and you haven't gotten an answer yet, it's because I've been talking and rambling on for so long. I'm usually 20 or 30 minutes behind your question. And that just means you either get your answer later when you watch the playback or you sit through all of this to this point to where you can start to hear from me now. <laughs> so let me see what I can do with this conversation box. All right. Oh, I guess I could show you this. I did add a second camera here, so I'm sitting there idling the whole time. So here is the turf scrubber in place in my sump. And it is sitting on an acrylic stand that is sandwiched over the bubble trap of my sump. Underneath the turf scrubber is a... Let me turn this off. Underneath is a filter sock in case... I mean, there's no algae on there yet because I just turned it on last night and I haven't seeded it with anything. But uh, there is a sock underneath, so if any algae were to fall out for some reason somehow, it would be caught in a sock and not go anywhere. And then... Um, you can see the plumbing is going from my manifold to that clear tubing. That is three quarter inch water flow going through there. And it's just raining down on a sheet inside the turf scrubber. The, uh, you can see the power plugs in the upper right corner and you can see the little labels I put on there of each power supply so I know what they are, like I mentioned earlier. And uh, in this uh, video you can also see the XHO is on over the refugium. There's a couple cooling fans. There, on the left lower corner is the uh, air silencer for the NIO skimmer. Uh, I had to buy special power cables for the turf scrubber because what it came with were the regular computer plugs that are straight, and I wanted a 90 degree angle so it wouldn't uh, interfere with the collection cup of the skimmer. So that is what I want to show you. I also added a carpet in my fish room that is made by Cobalt. And that carpet is uh, blue with an outline of a fish. Everyone thought it was a chalk outline when they saw the picture on Instagram. And uh, it's an absorbing mat. So if you have a spill or drips, it'll catch water. You know, I think it can hold like a gallon of water. So that's kind of nice. And I thought I can use it in the fish room. And then when I'm working on this side near the refugium, I can put it down on top of my regular carpet to protect it. It's rubber backed on the bottom side. And then it's got all this absorbent material on the top. And so that was another little thing I did this week. Uh, been doing a lot of stuff for my tank this week. All right. So while I'm letting you guys look at that, go see where the conversations are. <laughs> Someone saw my random roll of toilet paper. Greg Hurdle said, I hope you're coming to Niagara in July. I did say yes. It is literally days before my trip to San Diego. But I did say I could do it. Uh, Abe says, can we talk about microorganisms that might attack zoanthids? Yes, I would like to know what microorganisms are attacking it, how many you have, how many different colors do you have, how many are suffered, how many are doing well. Because you might have a few polyps that don't do well for no reason whatsoever, just because they choose not to do well. Zoanthids are a type of coral that like dirty water. And if your tank is very clean, low phosphate, low nitrate, they could actually not be doing well because the water's too pristine. We do need stuff in our tanks. Um, you might see brittle starfish inside zoanthids. You might see sponge inside zoanthids. You might see amphipods, isopods. Um, the, the isopods I'm talking about are the friendly ones that look like ants. Um, you might even see little tiny snails, like colonista snails. Chitons might be in there. There's all kinds of critters that crawl over a tank, especially at night. You can inspect all your stuff at night with a flashlight and see what's happening. And if you see something on a patch of zoanthids you're worried about, you can always remove it manually and then see if the zoanthids perk up. But uh, I just don't see anything that just destroys and will eat every single zoanthid out of your tank. That's just not common. Uh, St. Nova says, 
Could you touch on any issues with the skimmer slash return slash fuge layout? Building a new sump way down here in Jamaica. We are under quarantine, so I have some time <laughs> on my hands. Yeah, actually, that's the layout I've been recommending for about 15 years. Um, I love the idea of having the return zone in the middle of the sump rather than at the end. And originally, every sump I ever saw was always skimmer, refugium, return. And I just never saw that as beneficial because all the water would flow through the skimmer zone and then all of that water goes through the refugium, which was too fast, and then it would go into the return. And the other problem was your refugium had to be really shallow because the skimmer couldn't sit in a lot of water. So if your skimmer is, you know, like it can only sit in eight inches of water, your refugium will have to be seven inches high, and then your return zone is six, in six inches high. So with that situation, if you can split them and have the skimmer on one end and the refugium on the other, you could have eight inches on the left and you could have 12 and a half inches on the right, and the return zone can be around seven or eight inches deep. It works out really well. You can control the flow into the refugium to have it going in at a slower pace. You can have more flow. I actually recommend 75% of your tank should drain into the skimmer section and 25% should drain into the refugium. And I've recommended this forever. And more and more people are doing it, <laughs> which is awesome. I mean, it's, it, it's a really good way of divide and conquer and to have different water heights inside the same sump. Um, John, you said, what about good algae on the front glass? I don't know about good algae. Most of us don't want any algae on the front glass. Uh, maybe you mean good old algae, like, you know, let's talk about that because it happens to everyone. Uh, we have to keep our glass clean. You got to go over it with a razor blade or with a uh, cleaning magnet. Uh, the flipper cleaning magnet is one. I use the wooden one that uh, is called algae float. I've been using that one forever. I love it. And uh, keeping the glass clean is really important because it keeps your, your entire uh, perspective, your view of the tank in... in HD quality. <laughs> and if you just let a film happen, you're looking through the film to see the rest of your tank. And it's sort of like me, I wear glasses. If my glasses aren't clean, then the whole world looks dirty, you know, because I'm looking through a fog. And so we want to keep the glass clean. And if you stay on top of it, if you really do it well, and you're on it every single day, then nothing can really hold on tightly. You know, you might have a few uh, stubborn spots, but, you know, if you do, then you either use a credit card or use a razor blade to scrub that clean so that way it's nice and clean again. But if you neglect it for days at a time, then you'll start to get more and more algae on there and it becomes worse and then you don't notice things are happening and you uh, end up losing stuff. So stay on top of that. Uh, let's see. A lot of people are talking about toilet paper. <laughs> uh, Dave says, how big of an impact do you think this pandemic will affect small businesses like you or the local fish store? We really don't know. Um, I am cautiously optimistic that it won't be too much of a problem. It's definitely affecting uh, trade shows. It's affecting, uh, there's all these events, you know, like reef stock just happened. Uh, Reef of Palooza is coming up. Uh, Aquashella is coming. I think Aquashella even got bumped to a later date, if I remember correctly. I think I just saw that post. So all those shows are filled with coral sellers, and a lot of those are little guys that's you know that farm their own corals and then come to these shows and drive all over the U.S. Like the uh, Coral Farmers Market, he does a lot of those shows, and they count on five hundred or thousand people going through to make some money, and. Uh, when these shows can't happen, those vendors can't make any income, you know, because they're they're relying on I'm going to make money this weekend, next weekend, the next weekend, the next weekend, and during the week they're driving back home, they're restocking, they're cleaning their equipment, they're getting ready so that they can go to the next show. So it's really going to affect those guys because they are relying on uh, the impulse buy of the shopper that's going to the shows, and with people staying home and not going out as much, it could affect the fish stores somewhat. But I think most of us won't have a problem going into a supermarket or going to the gas station and we'd probably go to a fish store to get fish food or test kits or a new coral or fish instead of going to bigger events like frag swaps or uh, actual uh, day trade shows. 
that are popping up, you know, that we're so used to. I think there's going to be some avoidance of that for the time being. It's going to be a dip for some companies. Um, so uh, other than that, it really comes down to inventory. If there's any problem with the flow of inventory coming into the country and dispersing, that's the other part. But hopefully it'll be okay. Uh, let's see. <laughs> K. Fowl says, I'm going to go to Walmart, start coughing just to see people's reactions. No joke, man. I mean, I, people are definitely freaking out. And if you go ahead and sneeze in public or cough in public, uh, one person, this was a week ago, uh, actually posted on Facebook, I read it, and I was like, wow. They were on an aisle and they coughed, I think it was? No. I think they sneezed, and they sneezed into their arm. And this woman irately said, you should not be here, go home. And the store manager asked this customer to leave, the, the guy that sneezed. And he was like, I got thrown out. <laughs> and I'm just like, wow. I mean, some people are gonna sneeze because they have allergies. Others are gonna sneeze because they have asthma. I mean, there's certain things that we all have. Uh, I clear my throat. You know, it doesn't mean I've got a, a virus, but there's, there's a risk that there's a possibility that person might have it, or they got it from someone, or they knew someone, you know. So there is some overreacting at this point that's uh, unfortunate. Let's see. Uh, someone just said, you know, the coronavirus isn't that bad. We really don't know how bad it is. We do know that there's no cure for it. <laughs> So it comes down to how strong your immune system is. And I have heard recently that uh, children can be carriers of it, but not show any kind of symptoms. And that the older generation is the one at the biggest risk. So, you know, I'm getting there. I'm nervous. Got to be careful. Let's see. Um, oh, Afonso says, I'm new to saltwater tanks, and one of my doubts is about using distilled water. I use RODI for top-off, but I've read that people use distilled. Uh, regards from Portugal, and stay safe. Hey, thank you very much. Um, distilled water is water made from steam. It is considered the purest water you can get. Um, but you're having to buy it and lug it home. You can definitely use RODI water for your reef tank. That's all I've been using. I've, I don't think I've ever used distilled for my tank, ever. I had to buy some, like a gallon, um, because if you have an iron to iron your shirt, or slacks or whatever, uh, they say to use distilled water in there, so that way you won't get the uh, calcium deposits or the hard, wa hard water deposits on the front of your iron. So there are times when you need distilled water, but for our reef tanks, I think that's more like a last ditch effort. You know, if you're like, I have no other choice, I gotta buy some water, what do I buy? So you get distilled, but I wouldn't intentionally go buy it and try to run a tank off of that and do water changes with it. That's it's expensive. Just get an RODI system and make your water and make your salt water. That's the best way to go. Estonian Reefer says, do you think you could ever go into business with corals? What I mean is frag and grow them for a side business. <laughs> I like that you said side business. Um, I don't want to. But that being said, maybe 10 years from now when I don't want to touch anything made of acrylic, maybe I'll be selling corals. You know, maybe I'll have a farm. <laughs> you know, not with a cow and chickens and pigs, but corals. Uh, maybe, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of people that sell corals, and some sell them to hobbyists, some sell them at, uh, to fish stores, you know, like they grow them and they supply the stores. So there's different ways to sell corals. Some just sell them or give them to the store for store credit, and they'll, they'll amass a lot of credit so they can buy salt and test kits and refractometers and pumps and lights and whatever, because they just keep bringing corals to the store, and the store wants those frags because they're homegrown, which is great. But see, the thing is, if someone says, Mark, I love that coral in your tank. Can you send me a frag? I mean, yeah, I can do it. 
But here's the process. I've got to snip the coral off and glue it on a frag plug, just like every other business out there. I've got to get a box that has an insulated cooler. I've got to pack this box so that that livestock stays the right temperature. And I have to get it to the FedEx by 6 p.m. for overnight shipping to arrive at 9 a.m. in the morning. And if everything goes right, the customer gets it. All they had to do was open the door and say thank you. It was like an Amazon delivery. It's so easy. I went through all the trouble to make sure that the coral or corals in question are all packed carefully and delivered to FedEx, which that's going to be at least an hour for that order to get everything just right. We could say less, but it's probably going to be about an hour. I mean, just all said and done. And what if it's 15 to 20 to 30 minutes per box? What if it's 15 minutes a box? I don't know. But the thing is, you've got I've got to spend a lot more time doing it. All you have to do is receive it. <laughs> and then I also have to field the questions like, I asked for this, you sent me this, or it doesn't look the same as what I was expecting. That's the first thing. The second thing, FedEx lost my box. I don't know where it is. I'm freaking out. Third thing, everything showed up and it's dead. Fourth thing, it never showed up at all. It doesn't exist. You tried to rip me off. Fifth thing, everything's perfect and they still file a claim with PayPal. <laughs> <laughs> There's these are true things that happen to coral sellers and I have good friends that have said don't you dare sell corals you will be miserable and uh, you know I can't really argue with that plus when do I have time I can barely keep up with what I gotta do now and I mean you know I, I am keeping up but my point is I'm having a hard time editing videos to get those out so I mean if I was spending time with coral selling then I would rule out that window of having you know a few hours to work on building a video so I, I really would like to continue our streams edit videos fill orders for customers and not make my life more complicated um, Mike asked me what was the extra canister of the RODI that was the DI so the RO system is sediment, carbon, carbon, membrane, booster pump, TDS meter. And then the extra one that you call extra is the DI. That's the fifth stage. And the DI is what polishes the water to get ready for the tank. All the stuff that happens before it is RO water, reverse osmosis water. And we can drink that water or cook with that water. And that's what I choose to do. So I make all my drinking water, I, my coffee, tea, uh, any kind of cooking I do, I use that water for, you know, like uh, a recipe. But, uh, you know, if I'm going to boil potatoes, I don't use RO water. <laughs> I just use tap. But, you know, like spaghetti and potatoes and things like that. But if there's something that says, you know, add a half a cup of water, I'll use RO water. So you've got RO water for yourself, for your household, and then you have DI for the aquarium. And so I've sold it that way with a DI separate since I started selling them intentionally so you could have drinking water so that your house can benefit from having a system and not just the aquarium. So many people buy this for their aquarium and are cutting themselves out of the huge benefit of having nice pure water in their house that they can drink that tastes great and don't have to keep buying bottled water at the store. <laughs> oh, let's see. Martinez says, let's talk about the sudden PO4 explosion. Saturday's test was 0 0.11. Wednesday was 1.67. It has to be wrong. Friday, the fish store tested 1.54. Nothing died. Nothing changed. Something got in your tank. Probably food. Whether someone helped feed the tank or an auto feeder dropped in way too much. Those are my first initial guesses. Um... I can't really think of anything else that would make phosphate jump so high, you know, like a full point. You know, you weren't talking about point this. You're saying you went from 0.11 all the way to 1.6, which is a lot. Um, I would use phosphate or X to bring it back down. And uh, that way you can get it back to the manageable level. It is odd that that happened. Uh, start looking at everything. Uh, oh, also another thing that could suddenly show a huge... Uh, uptick in phosphate would be if your protein skimmer overflowed and all the waste in the cup went back into the system accidentally. That's another one. Uh, but those are the only ones I can think of off the top of my head. Uh, Becky says, does the booster pump in your RODI system help reduce the amount of wastewater or is it just because of low pressure? 
Well, my, wa my water pressure here is pretty good. As a matter of fact, that's a very old booster pump, and I think it's done. <laughs> when I was filling up the big 250-gallon poly tank, it rained for like three days straight. And I'd say about an hour before the tank was full, it just stopped running. And I was like, tap, 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 nothing happened. Tap, tap. I was like, all right, so I unplugged it. And uh, I think the next day I plugged it in and it came back on. But I watched my pressure gauge. And my tap water seems to be right around like 74 PSI. And when I plug in the uh, booster pump now, you know, because I was doing all this work, so I was looking at it really close yesterday, it only went up to like 76 PSI. It was so small. I was like, it barely did this much on the gauge. I think I need to replace it. But the booster pump puts more pressure across the membrane, and the membranes work better with more pressure. They're more efficient. And by more efficient, yes, you'll have less wastewater, you'll have better pure water, and I would just... Uh, and there are times where you absolutely need it. I don't 100% need it because my PSI is so good coming out of the tap, but uh, there are people that are on a well, or there are people that have 40 PSI coming out of their, their faucet, or 30 PSI, and adding a booster pump can in generally add you almost 40 PSI more. So it is a good thing to have for those that need it, but it's not an absolute necessity. Uh, like I said, mine apparently has been limping along and I just didn't quite notice. I just assumed all was well, and then, you know, that's when I took the big hard look, and I was like, well, what's actually happening right now? And I said, oh, I need to deal with this one. Uh, Jason says, did you let Minion play with the plywood with the plywood parts for your mounts? No, actually that was all hand cut with a skill saw, me being super risky. I didn't want to deal with the table saw or anything, I just wanted to make some cuts and be done. Uh, it was actually skill saw and a uh, compound miter saw <laughs> that I could just do some nice straight cuts. And then I have a belt sander, so I was running the pieces on that just, just to get it over with. I, basically, it was sort of like... I think this will work. I'm going to do it sort of like a test, but I'm going to do it as if it's going to officially be like this forever, because it might be. <laughs> and, you know, even as I installed it, I thought, man, I wish this was already painted, but I need to see if it would even look right, if it would hang right, if everything looked correct. And now that it does, uh, I might replace the one for the Versa with an acrylic one, because it's on the edge of the sump anyway. And, you know, that's a wet area in general. And, I mean, yeah, I could paint it, and I might just, I don't know. I'm on the fence. I might paint it and be done with it, or I might make an acrylic one for that one. The one hanging over the metal pipe, that one is going to stay there. Uh, it, it needs to have a, a coat of paint, but I could pretty much paint that in place and just move on. But no, that was all hand cut. I didn't want to uh, turn on Minion and make all that noise just for that. Oh, this is a good one. Ellery says, talk about serviceability designs in stands, sumps, controllers, these are often overlooked. So, if you buy a stand with your aquarium, and there's only like a single door in the middle, and then there's a whole bunch of wood, and it's wood, and the back is enclosed too, you only can access from that front narrow entryway. And that's really difficult, because you have to do everything through there. You have to get to the protein skimmer, you have to reach in to deal with plumbing underneath, you've got to maybe install a light fixture for the refugium with some kind of clamp mount. Uh, if you have plugs, you've got to install a power strip, and it's really hard. One of the things, I was just, I did a quote on a sump recently up in uh, Aubrey, Texas, and when I got there, it's a 300 gallon tank on a stand, and again, the stand was a little shorter than I like, but that's okay. But I asked him, I said, how are we getting the sump in? That's what matters to me most. <clears throat> it can, and I looked inside the cabinet, so the top of the cabinet was solid, so you could not, you could not drop, you know, take the tank off, drop the sump in, and put the tank back on top. It has to go in somehow, either through the front, through the back, or through the end. I love a stand that has a door on the end to slide the sump in and close the door. That is the best stand you can get. And if you're shopping for a stand and you haven't bought one yet, try to find that or have it made that way. Because what you can do is you can actually open the door, slide the sump all the way in, and then you could even put up a little barrier after the sump, you know, some kind of short piece of plywood divider to keep moisture from getting to the side. And now you can mount all your power stuff there, and you can open the door to deal with plugs and things and close the door and it's out of sight. And that would be super sweet if you... Uh, the more access, the better. That's why I've had no woodwork around my tank for so long. I like to be able to reach in from any angle with minimal effort, without having something in my way. But, you know, 
I, as I mentioned earlier in the stream, I'm thinking about adding a uh, the woodwork around the tank, you know, for a couple of reasons. Uh, no, no issues with uh, someone putting something in my tank when they're visiting, as well as um, kind of keeping the tank super duper quiet, even when everything's running. So I am on the... I'm, you know, even then, when I make it, I'm going to make it to where it's easy to remove so I can work on the tank. I love the flexibility of being able to reach in. And so, and the other thing that I really don't like about some sumps, and I'm not picking any certain brand because I don't know them all, but I've seen some that have a lot of little compartments and little nooks and crannies. And it looks so cool on paper, and it even looks really great dry. But then when you put all your stuff in, it is so tightly compact that it's impossible to work on anything. And you have to unscrew these three things to get that thing out, for example. Or you've got this tethered down to where you can't remove it unless you remove all the tethering. And, I mean, you know, cable management looks so cool until you have to undo it. <laughs> and having tubing mounted to the top rim of the sump, for example, not the dosing tubes, but like your plumbing comes down, goes into a bulkhead, then has to come out and go onto the top of the pump, and now you've got to disconnect. I mean... There's ways to make that easy to work on, and there's ways that just seem overly complicated. And in the case of my sump, I made this huge sump. I remember uh, someone very adamantly said it was such a waste of space. Why would I make it so big? Because I could have used that space for something else. I'm like, for what? What else am I doing? This is the sump. <laughs> there's nothing else I had to go down there. And then recently, you know, I told you guys, what am I going to do with this turf scrubber? because it's this huge file cabinet looking thing. And I debated all the locations and finally I decided, you know what? <laughs> it's gonna fit in the middle of my huge sump that was much too big and it works out great. And it actually uh, looks like I made the sump design for that thing, it's kind of cool. So I'm, I'm just really excited to, you know, eight, 12 weeks from now to tell you guys, oh my God, what a difference it's made, it's fantastic. <laughs> and how it's uh, pulled my nitrates down, that would be awesome. But the, uh, if you, if you don't see that in advance, you know, as a, as a newer hobbyist, you probably won't, you may not realize how challenging you made the setup for yourself. And if you make something difficult to do, odds are you're not going to do it. So if you, for example, I don't know, put your heaters all the way in the back of the sump where you can't even see them, you are probably not going to visually inspect them. You're not going to verify that they're turning on and off properly like you should, or you can't even see that they're turning on or off other than maybe if they're plugged into a controller and you can verify the temperature went up when the heater came on, that kind of thing. But I mean, there's a lot of us that they hide a heater in the overflow box. It's invisible. They don't know it exists until they have to reach in because some fish jumped in there and they're like, let me pull the heater out. Let me pull this out. Let me get the pipe out. Let me catch the fish. So that kind of happens. But if uh, you put things in the very back or behind or underneath something, odds are you're not going to remove things to get that thing that's underneath. Or when you do need to get to it, you're like, oh, I got to remove this, this, and this to get that item. This kind of sucks, you know? <laughs> it's not the end of the world. It just means you're going to get your hands wet. You're going to spend extra time doing it. But that's my point. If it takes extra time, you may postpone or procrastinate on it because of the hassle factor. And we, you know... I try to keep things as simple and easy to do so that I can just do it and move on. And that's what I always recommend to you guys as well. Uh, Becky, I'm coming back to you about your RODI system. You say there's a lot of waste. You need to measure how much water is coming out of the RO system and how much water is coming out of the, out of the, uh, the waste line. So basically get two two liter bottles that are empty or two one-gallon buckets, or whatever it is that are exactly the same size, that hold the same amount of water. Put both tubes in, you know, so you got the RODI water going into one, and you've got the waistline going the other, and then turn the system on and watch. And when the waste container is full, turn it off and see how much is in the good container. The good container should have at least 25% full of water or, you know, 75% empty. Basically, that would be four to one. Four parts waste to one part good. So you want to see a full, you know, like if it's a two-liter bottle, two liters full to the top, then you should have uh, half of one liter in the other, or more. You might have one liter to two liters of waste. 
And a lot of people think waste is so much water. It's really not that much. It, it looks terrifying because it's coming out of a quarter inch tube and you've seen it flow, but that is exactly how they work. And what's happened is the best water was stripped out and sent out the RODI water and the, the particulate laden dirty water, the concentrated dirty water is what came out the waistline. Uh, yeah, and Ellery brings this up as well, and this is something I just kind of touched on. Cable management. When you hook up nine things to your tank, you have nine power cords to deal with. And exponentially, it just gets worse. The bigger the tank, the more stuff you hook up, the more wires you have. And I've got a bajillion wires going everywhere. I do like to take as much extra wire as I can, and I, you know, either loop it or do that zigzag thing, and then I take a zip tie around it and I tie that bundle. I try to tie up as many bundles as I can so that way it's power cord from the controller, the bundle, and then it goes up to said item. But we, some of us have some real rat's nests. And while it's nice to be able to hide the nest of wires inside a cabinet or inside the back of a box, you know, like a, a power panel that has all the stuff hidden behind, it's just crazy. And it would be awesome if we could actually choose the length. Like Ella was saying, you know, splice the wires. If we could say, I only need a 5.4 foot wire. I don't need a six foot wire. You know, that'd be nice, but that's not how things are sold. And so we are kind of in a situ a quandary of what to do. Uh, I do like to shorten cable wires where I can, uh, but it's very rare, very rare that I change like through splicing. I remember the dart pumps, the power cord was not long enough and it had to reach all the way over to my power panel. And I decided immediately when I opened the box, I'm gonna replace the power cord. I literally opened up the electrical box on top of the pump and removed the rubber grommet, disconnected the wires, removed the six foot cord it came with or the 10 foot cord or whatever it was. And I went to Home Depot and I found 15 foot power cords 15, not 50, <laughs> 15 foot power cords that were the exact same gauge. And I could put that in, wire it in. And my pump had a super long wire that could reach all the way to where I had to plug in. And I didn't have to have a short extension cord because adding four or five feet of cord to the cord that it came with meant that the two prongs, you know, the, the male and female, were gonna be right in front of the sump where they'd get splashed. I want that to be a continuous wire with no opening, no chance of moisture. So I basically modified each of those pumps with the cord. I even had a backup pump that was uh, brand new and I replaced the cord on it. So if I was traveling and my tank setter had to deal with it, he could get the pump, he could just unplug the old, disconnect the unions, put the new pump in, tighten the unions, run the new cord into the outlet and everything's back to normal. He never had to do it, but it was prepared in case he did. And that was my option. But like last night, I'm looking at these cords for uh, the dosing pumps and quite a few were pretty long and I coiled them up and I zip tied them together. And if you have to loosen them again, you just cut the zip tie carefully, don't cut the wire. And you can uh, you know, deal with that one thing you have to remove. But yeah, it's important to do that. And then there's, you also may find, uh, like I've noticed when I'm shopping for zip ties, they have zip ties with a grommet on the end. They cost more, <laughs> but it allows you to screw the zip tied item to the cabinet and keep that coil exactly where you need it instead of just dangling in the way. So you don't have to worry about it, you know, uh, interfering when you're trying to work in your sump. Uh, Kay Miller says, with the steel stand, you could have used neodymium. <laughs> neodymium. You know, I've read that word a thousand times. I've never said it out loud. Neodymium magnets. And uh, yeah, I could have. I would have had to glue the magnet to the plastic bracket. Or I could have mounted the magnets to the wooden plank. That's true. Uh, one of the things I thought about doing, well, I'm still thinking about doing with the woodwork for the stand you know, that I've been playing with in my brain since the day I got it, was to get, I think there's a tool called a biscuit cutter for woodwork, and it carves out uh, a notch. There's different tools like this, but I was thinking it'd be really cool, you've got your wooden panel that's going to be your cabinet door, and you use that tool to create this socket, this notch. Then drop the magnet down inside and then close it off with putty so it doesn't exist. And the magnet is just inside the wood under the skin and you go click, but no one can see it. <laughs> and I was thinking about that for the woodwork. I didn't think about it for the power 
brick because I don't want that to come loose. It's just, I want that to stay where it is, not fall down, not fall into water, not get pulled down accidentally. I want it to be a lot more secure. Normally all power bricks I have are screwed to a cabinet. So this guy here, I didn't have anywhere to screw it into. So that's why I made this wooden gizmo and I screwed that to it and put the thing on and it's, it's there to stay. But you're not wrong. Uh, EJ says, I'm waiting for my algae scrubber to arrive and I'm currently running Ketomorpha in my refugium. Should I keep it or remove it and add more live rock to my refugium? Uh, I think you should just hook up the turf scrubber and see what happens and then decide. Because if you change things all at once, you're going to remove one thing before the other thing's even kicked in. And I would just leave it. Uh, I'm going to run this turf scrubber and see what happens in my refugium. I'm not, uh, I don't have any goals at this time of what I'm going to do. I, I thought about what I could possibly do there in that zone instead. But for now, I'm uh, just going to let everything run and see what happens. Uh, Quarterbox says, random question, but would you know if new lights cause sudden algae blooms? A few days after installing it, my glass is full of algae. Never happened again after scraping the glass. Never happened again. Um, well, yeah, let's say you have a certain amount of nutrients in the water. You've added a new light. It's, you're probably running it at a really high intensity initially because you're enjoying it and checking it out and running it way too long. And so you get an algae bloom on the glass. Yeah, that's, I could see that happening. The algae just grows and thrives off the nutrients, maybe uses up some of it. Uh, it's interesting that it didn't come back, but I wouldn't attribute uh, algae growth necessarily to be because the light was new, because I've, sw I've swapped out lights on my Anemone Cube. I went from a Gen 2 to a Gen 4 Pro, which is a much better uh, version of the light, and nothing changed in there, not even anemones, nothing changed. I didn't suddenly have an algae growth of any kind. I didn't see anemone growth all of a sudden. It just was like I swapped it out and no one cared. So... That is interesting that it only happened once and not again, but uh, I don't know. I'd have to have more information to answer that one. Thank you, Bruno. I appreciate you tuning in from Portugal. Um, Cliffy Poo says, have you thought about patenting the heater holder you made, are you going to put them on your site? No, I haven't. I'm not going to patent anything. I mean, in the U.S., patents cost between five dollars and $50,000, apparently. It's a lot of money. And I'm sure someone has made something slightly similar. I liked what I made. I just, I thought it up. Um, I have seen some holders in the past, uh, like, that would have, like, an O-ring on the end so that the heater can't come out. Mine literally just lay it in there. There's no holder. So, I mean, there's a slight differentiation from things I've seen in the past. Uh, usually I see these brackets glued in the back wall of the sump, and then you put the heaters there. It's like this cool little shelf, like a gun rack in your sump. But the thing is, is that I wanted it between the baffles because I want the water to flow through the heaters and into the next zone. Every drop of water crosses the heaters, is my thought, other than what's coming through the refugium. And... I also liked the idea of being able to lower it in and, and, and lift it out again, so I made that handle, rather than some kind of a gizmo that you have to insert that's like a brick. And then finally, the biggest challenge, if anyone wants it, is having the space for it. Uh, I made the bracket an inch and three quarters wide, so if the baffles are two inches apart, it fits. And I made it where the length of it is 12 inches. Some people may not be able to get that in their sump because the opening may not be 12 inches on top. It might be less. So I kind of need to know what fits people's tanks before I can even mass produce anything. But I do like the idea of getting them out to people if it'll work for them. I also need to know the total height that works for them. You know, for example, if their section only has six inches of water and I made the thing for three heaters, the top one would be out of the water. <laughs> and that's not good, as you can imagine. So I need to find out what will work for you guys for me to make more of that one. And then, of course, I have to get some more of that acrylic rod. You know, that was just some scrap I had here and I just used. But, uh, yeah, it looks really cool. And uh, let me find a picture to show you guys really quick. Well, I don't know how quickly I can find it, but... <laughs> I um, posted this picture. This will work. That wasn't bad. 
So here you can see all the heaters are in a row and right, well, you can't see where I'm pointing, but um, under the Mila's Reef sticker, there's like a round circle about four inches, five inches down. If you're thinking distance, I mean, what is that? One inch in real life? I don't know. Um, anyway, that's the handle above the surface of the water. And I inserted there and that spot was perfect. Water flows over the first baffle, goes under that middle one, and then comes up through the heaters and then goes over to the left toward the return pump. And you can see the return pump right there with a strainer basket on the front. And above it is the turf scrubber sitting on its new stand. So that worked out really, really well. And here it is from the backside. <laughs> and now I'm back. Um, Derby City says, I'm curious as to how exactly your metal halides work that switch the colors from blue to white. Can you explain that a little bit? So it's a metal halide bulb with a screw on end, which is called a mogul socket. And it screws into a, mo well, it's a mogul ended bulb that screws into a mogul socket. Sorry, I said that wrong. And inside the glass shield is an arc. And the arc is the actual light. The outer shield is what protects us from UV radiation. So when Reef Bright, Reef Bright came out with these bulbs, they created something called the twin arc. So there's two arcs inside the glass bulb with a metal socket on the end. When you turn it on, the first light that comes on is the the, uh, the first arc, and it's the 10,000 Kelvin, because that's what I buy. I buy a 10,000, 20,000 bulb, it's both. The first arc comes on, and it floods the tank with white light. When I turn it off, and one minute later turn it back on, and I do this through the apex, the arc is so hot it can't start again. But the other arc is not hot, and so it turns on, and it ignites the blue light. So it's actually triggering one, and then the other. And I have it tied into a Reef Bright ballast. I've used other ballasts I already owned in the past. I had ice cap ballasts, I had magnetic ballasts, I had, uh, I think, a coral view ballast there for a while. And sometimes with other ballasts, other than the Reef Bright ballast, it might cycle out of order and you're expecting to see blue light, but it was doing white. It's like it, it missed a beat and it was the wrong color. And people were complaining about that years ago. You know. I almost, I never hear that complaint anymore. But when I was talking with Tulio and I said, you know, so sometimes I get the wrong color. He said, well, it could be your ballast. I said, you know what? Just send me your ballast. I'll use your ballast with your bulb. And I never have that problem. It always comes on white first and then it turns off for a minute, turns on and goes to blue. And then it turns off and then the next day it starts up, it's white. And then an hour and a half later, it's off and on and it's blue. And that's how it works. Wow. That's interesting. Um, Mass is saying that in Europe, every event is canceled from local dance groups to soccer matches. Wow. I didn't think about that, but yeah, you're right. Any kind of sporting event. Uh, the silent one says, how long would you run four times T5 bulbs over 120 gallon SPS aqua reef with a high LED light? Okay, so let's say your LED light provides tons of great light. I'm going to just give you some arbitrary numbers and you can try it out and see how you like it. If you want to have the LED light provide the abundance of light in your tank for growth, you'll probably want to run that light for seven to nine hours a day. And then the actinics you're talking about, you could start them an hour before the LEDs and then go an hour after the LEDs. So if your maximum lights of the LED is seven, you have a nine hour photo period. If it's nine, you have an 11 hour photo period. I talked to someone recently who was running their lights and they had 12 hours of LED and they had four hours of uh, some kind of a strip light before and they had four hours of strip light after. It was 18 hours of light a day and I was like, <laughs> way too much light. And it, all that does is grow algae and the corals don't do well because they don't get enough rest and he had anemones that were going under the rock and not coming out. They were just getting too much. It was too much light. So I really do recommend seven to nine hours for the photo period. And then if you want an hour before and after for some blue glow to make yourself happy, I get it. I do that too. <laughs> but that would be my recommendation. And like I said, try it, see how it works for you. And if you like it, stick with it. If you don't like it, shift it later in the day so that it gets, you know, whatever, 
you know, I just I try not to go super long. I think a lot of people make the mistake of using, running their lights too long per day. I think I answered that one. Let's see. <laughs> Just another nano tank says, sorry, Chris, it's a raffle prize. We're talking about this. It's not a raffle. There's no raffle. There's no money. It's just me shipping a roll of toilet paper to someone in need, someone that needs a roll of toilet paper. I've been trying to understand why toilet paper is the number one commodity when there's a virus. I guess they're thinking they're going to have a lot of diarrhea. I mean, I don't know. You would think they'd be buying a lot of hand sanitizer, but uh, toilet paper, that's the number one choice. It's very odd. Let's see. Um, I'm going to read this out loud and see if it makes sense. Albert says, I started to install an RODI system from BRS. I tested it, everything was good, and I had to run a water line Fast forward one year later, it's been unused but full of water. Could this have damaged? Oh, I see what you're saying. So you tried it out, you got it wet, and then you let it sit stagnant for a year? Yes, that is not good. Um, water sitting on that membrane and in those filters is just a breeding ground for bacteria. And having it full of water for that duration, I would toss everything out. I would keep the entire gizmo, but I'd replace the membrane and the filters. I'm sorry. I mean, it just is. You should have run that water line a long time ago. But I would not take the chance and try to use it, uh, especially that unit has been sitting in the garage, getting hot in the summer, uh, and then it's in, and it's cold. It's just, no, can't do it. If you ever do need to store an RO system, drain the water out of the housings, throw away the pre-filters, which are the ones underneath, remove the membrane from the membrane housing, put that in a, in a plastic bag with a little bit of water, and put it in the back of your refrigerator to protect it. And then when you're ready to use it, take it out of the fridge, put it back in the housing, put new filters in, and start it up. But uh, no, whenever you have stagnant water sitting anywhere, it's a no-no for this hobby. You just get rid of it, start fresh. So I'm going to say you got to buy new filters and membrane from BRS for that unit. Uh, Kay Miller says, I'm making a seahorse tank. Would gobies and a pistol shrimp be fine with seahorses? I think so. Um, I, I understand why you'd want that, and I don't think a pistol shrimp would mess with a seahorse. Can't guarantee it, but I don't think it'll mess with a seahorse. I mean, if the seahorse gets too close to their little hidey hole, it might protect it. You know, it might defend it. You know, if like the seahorse came in to chase some food, the shrimp might smack them, <laughs> possibly. But I could see why you'd want to do that. Uh, I guess it just depends on the size of the tank, the size of the seahorses. Um, you know, what else is in there? But I like that idea. I, I, I could see you having gorgonians in there, porcelain crab in there, um, maybe a sand conch to help keep the sand clean or nasarius. Uh, I do like the idea of different, idea, uh, different critters in there. Uh, and I think, now I'm thinking of the Yasha gobies, which is the little tiny goby and the little tiny uh, shrimp. If you're talking about the big snapping uh, pistol shrimp, and the big long goby, and maybe that's not a good choice for your seahorse, uh, yeah, seahorse tank. <laughs> Someone asked me if I had autographed the TP. <laughs> Let's see. I answered that already. Uh, James says, I'm new. What's the best time to test alkalinity and calcium? And can I dose them both at the same time? So I say test on Saturday. <laughs> the time of day doesn't really matter, but it would be nice if, let's say, you love doing it at 10 o'clock in the morning, then every single Saturday you do it at 10 o'clock in the morning. If you can avoid doing tests at different times of day and different days of the week, you'll get a consistency of what's literally happening in your tank at around the same time of day every single day. Uh, you know, and, and you could compare that to a lot of things in real life too, but let's just keep it simple. I would, you know, pick a day and time you want to test. 
and you could test. And then dosing alkaline and calcium, you don't dose them at the same time. If you're manually dosing them and you're pouring them in, you're going to pour in one, you know, so you're going to have to pour it into a little measured cup and it's going to show how many milliliters you have, and you're going to trickle it into an area of high flow into your tank, like right where the water's pouring out and the water's kind of uh, uh, rippling, you want that to really mix in. You don't just pour it in on a dead end because it'll just be a cloud that goes in and it's really dense and then it kind of, it could even precipitate out, which means it kind of collapses upon itself and becomes worthless. So you trickle it in very slowly. This little tiny dosing cup, you're trickling it in, trickling it in, trickling it in, trickling it in for about 30 seconds, barely adding it. Trickle, 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 trickle for 30 solid seconds till the cup is empty. Then you get bottle number two and you fill up the other cup because you don't put the same liquid or different liquid in the same cup because of a chemical reaction. They have two bottles, two caps. And you're going to pour that cup and now you come over to your tank. It's been about a minute now. And you can trickle, 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 trickle for 30 seconds and now you're done. And you can do that. If you want to use dosing pumps to automate this process, and you've got the bottles under the tank and you've got this dosing pump or two dosing heads, obviously, you could have one trickle in. You could dose your alkalinity in the morning and then 12 hours later you could dose the calcium. That way there's no way they interfere with each other. If it's dosing directly in the tank, again, it needs to dose into an area that's high flow. If you're dosing it directly into the sump, then I highly recommend a really small power head uh, situated directly under the dosing tubes and the flow of the water shooting up to creating like a little hill of water. So as the water's trickling in from the dosing pump, it's immediately chopping it up and mixing it before it can move through to the next zone or into your return pump. That would be my recommendation. Uh, Saint Nova says, how much space do I truly need for my protein skimmer? An inch around or do I need to give it breathing room? It's big, so any upgrade should have more than enough space. Um, I like to have a tight skimmer zone. So you want to have enough room for the protein skimmer and the drains and whatever has to be there, like the filter sock. You don't need a big swimming pool with a skimmer standing in that swimming pool. You want to have that contained so the raw water comes in and the skimmer is processing that little body of water as best it can. So a couple of inches around it is what I recommend. Uh, that's pretty much what I do when I build sumps for customers. I find out exactly what they have and I give them an, an area with like a couple of extra inches. And try to center the protein skimmer in the middle of your sump rather than too close to the edge. Because if and when the collection cup overflows, you want to overflow into the sump and not over the rim of the sump and all over the floor or the cabinet because while the skimmer will continue to be this volcano sending water out and spilling all over the floor, your top-off system might be replacing with water constantly. Skimmer's wasting, water's coming in, salinity is dropping in the tank because there's no automation to stop it. So keep the protein skimmer in the middle of the sump so when it doesn't overflow, it overflows everywhere in the sump, the water level never changes in the sump, and your top-off won't turn on prematurely. Uh, Cameron says, how do you get Recordia to stay on a rock? Uh, that's kind of a challenge. You know, Recordias are mushrooms. And mushrooms, you know, they hold onto rocks or shells or whatever they can get their little feet on. But they also can release and land elsewhere. Sometimes a, a nice trick is to use some branching rock so that it's wrapped around the branches and is really colorful. Or to get a, what's called a uh, shelf rock. So it's very thin and it's kind of a wide shelf. And you could actually take that and set it down in the sand and put all your recordia on top so they have the rock to hold on to, but they're kind of nestled in and you're not looking at a boulder, you're looking at, you know, a ledge with recordia. If one does pop off, you can always put it back, um, but you can't keep them there forever. I mean, they are animals, they're gonna choose what they wanna do. If they are abandoning the rock, maybe there's a reason. Um, Kevin James says, what does it mean when an anemone inflates and the mouth opening is really huge? Uh, it could be just exhaling. It could be that it's miserable. Uh, usually you want the mouth to be pretty much closed up, kind of resemble a belly button or a, yeah, something along that, a balloon knot. <laughs> um, but, you know, it could be pooping. 
It could be inhaling. Um, anemones do all kinds of crazy things. They can turn themselves into what looks like a ball of socks. They also can uh, twist round and around, and their trunk is, looks like a candy cane. It looks insane. I've seen mine do that many times. I've never understood why they do it. Eventually, they untwist themselves again. I don't understand why it happens. But uh, hopefully what you're seeing is only occasional and not a regular thing. If it just gets wider and worse and worse and just never seems to close up again, it could be on its way out. So uh, you have to kind of keep an eye on it and see if it's just an abnormality for once or if there's an irregular occurrence of something going on. Let's see. Uh, Reef Druid says, what do you think about the automatic skimmer neck cleaner? I was thinking about picking one up from BRS on sale and wanted to know what you thought. I'm using one. I've been using one from a Bass Marine for, I don't know how long, 10 years, maybe longer. I've had to replace the motor on it a few times. It actually used to fit my Euro Reef and that same lid fit the Nios perfectly. I had to contact a, a Vast to get a new squeegee because the neck was a different diameter than the Euro Reef and the squeegee wouldn't reach or, or, it was, or it was too big and I had to have them shrink it. And so they, I, I don't know if they custom made me one or they just had the neck size down, but I replaced it and I've been running that one ever since. It runs for two minutes, eight times a day. And it's completely hooked up to the apex to just cycle through so you don't have to actually think about it. And uh, it just does, it, it keeps everything clean. It makes the skimmer more efficient. Totally love it. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, Tone Scott says, one of my nanos, which is a 30 gallon cube, I'm using a Kessel A80. I do understand that with a tank that's roughly 22 by 22, one light will suffice. Question is, would two be overkill? No, and you might enjoy it. You might even do something where instead of lights hang straight, you kind of tilt them in like, like floodlights on a movie scene. Might, you know, kind of avoid some shadowing in your tank. So, no, it wouldn't be overkill. Just keep in mind you're using twice as much light, twice as much intensity. You might want to dial them back so it's not quite as... God does, doesn't have all that oomph so you don't uh, end up bleaching out stuff. That would be my thought. But no, I've seen tanks with multiple lights on them. You know, I've seen small tanks with lots. It's been pretty cool. Mike Garcia says, where can I get screen covers and where can I buy to make my own? BRS sells a kit. Um, I'm sure other companies do too. DD, DD Solutions makes a really cool screen kit. Also, um, Custom, clear, ah. There's a place called Reef Gardens out of Phoenix that makes polycarbonate screen tops where they do exactly what fits your tank and they design it and ship it to you. So that's another one you could use if you didn't want to make your own. Uh, and then Trent asks me, and I don't know the answer, which way is the correct way for the light diffuser to face? Rough or smooth surface toward the light? I don't know. I'm going to assume smooth surfaces on the bottom, rough surface face up because it's easier to wipe off. But I don't know. I haven't used any diffusers. Let's see. How are we doing on time? Only two hours and 18 minutes? We got all day. Uh, Abe says, live aquaria, don't they quarantine? Divers Den quarantines for sure. <clears throat> Since Petco owns live aquaria now, there's some question of what's being done on, on the back end. 
but Diver's Den is still quarantining. I know that for sure. <laughs> uh, Saif says, uh, and he's asking about dinoflagellates. Um, I'm fighting it with for the last month. He's dosing Microbacter 7. His nitrates are 15. His phosphate is 0 0.03, but it's still on my sand. I would remove it. That's what I would do. I would remove it. I would stop all the flow in your tank. I would pile it all up into a heap, and I would siphon that out and then add a little bit of water to make up what you pulled out. Don't siphon out tons of water and put in a bunch of water because you're basically doing a water change. We're hoping you siphon out like half a gallon of water and you're putting in half a gallon and it's not enough to uh, awaken the beast. And you might have to do this a few times, but I would just keep removing its mass since everything else sounds like it's in line. Abe says, talk about your anemone tank. Well, what on earth could I tell you about it? It's, uh, it's going. Let me, uh, Move this camera over there, maybe. Let's see how much cord I have here. The anemone tank itself is basically an autopilot tank. It doesn't have any real effort other than cleaning the glass. And, you know, I feed it every day. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, it looks kind of hideous, <clears throat> like always. These webcams despise aquariums. So, uh, there's a... 12 clownfish in there, as far as I can tell. I count every time. They move so much, it's very hard to tell. And the hippo still swims around. Right now, it's the middle of the day. I mean, it's 4.30 here. And so the tentacles are out. Later on tonight, a lot of those tentacles will be retracted. Early in the morning, it's, again, retracted because the enemies are asleep. So the hippo actually swims everywhere. And, uh, you know, a lot of people... Uh, I say a lot. A f handful of people are like, what about the hippo? What about the hippo? I haven't had to move her yet. Uh, I haven't had the desire, or I don't even want to chase her down because she's already skittish. As soon as I get near the tank, if I'm not like bringing her your, her nine her ten thirty dinner, she'll like dart into the rock work instantly. It's not like she's gonna be a simple fish to remove from there. But if I reset this tank with a new one, then that would be the perfect time to catch her. For example, uh, the other choice is to try fish trap and see if maybe I'll get lucky and she'll go in. Um, but, uh, you know, she's actually quite content in there. She's not stressed. She's not sick. She's not uh, scarred up from stings. She seems to avoid the tentacles with no problem whatsoever. It's like she knows what she's doing. And even the vet that was here saw her, so there's nothing wrong with that hippo. <laughs> I was like, I know. She loves it there. So um, that's just uh, what you're looking at. There's some aptasia in there, and there's some bubble algae. I need to remove that acrylic box that's around my Vortec because it's got a lot of bubble algae in there right now. But I did some cleaning uh, recently around the teeth on the overflow box where the water flows into the drain because it was getting obscured with the bubble algae. I also removed some bubble algae off the top of the lock line tubing where all the anemones are holding on. You can, if you're looking at that uh, magnifying glass, if you look straight above it, there's like a black circle, like a black hole. That dot is the actual output of the lock line tubing. And there's probably 10 little anemones holding on to the lock line tubing, obscuring it, so you don't see the tubing at all. You just see the outlet where the water comes out. And above it, you can see the uh, Eheim auto feeder on top of the chimney, and that drops in food once a day, and all those little clownfish will squeeze into that little chimney <laughs> like sardines to all get little bites of flake food. And whatever they don't get goes blowing out in the water, and you'll see uh, the hippo tang swimming everywhere, getting bites of food that's blowing around in the tank like confetti. But it's, this tank is tied into the reef, and so it doesn't have any, you know, it's getting all the dosing, it's getting all the salt water, it's getting all the filtration, it's getting the heat. All I have to do is have a tank, you know, the auto feeder on there, the Vortec running, and um, the Radeon on top is lighting it. Uh, this pump, this uh, tank's pump, or its feed pump, is the Vectra L1, which is tied into my manifold. 
the manifold feeds the reactors, the algae turf scrubber, and the anemone cube. And that's kind of everything. This tank's been running for six and a half years, and it's got Starfire glass on three sides. It was not drilled for an overflow box, so I built the overflow box that's in there, and uh, it's doing its thing. I'm looking for the next question. Uh, Garrett says, I have my Apex and Trident new in the box. Nervous and a bit intimidated to set it up. Any suggestions or info on getting the courage to finally open the packages? Number one, open the packages. Number two, follow the directions. They have excellent tasks or tutorials to get you step-by-step -step running. It's very simple out of the box. When you first hook it up, you're gonna plug in the main power brick, which is the 832, to the wall. You're gonna plug the brain into the power brick through a Aquabus cable, which is a USB wire. But follow the directions. And the first thing you're gonna do before you do anything is get the Wi-Fi connected to it so you can start using the app or Fusion to log in with, a, uh, you know, with any kind of device. Then, do after you've done all that, then you might plug things into it. If you plug things in immediately, like here are eight outlets, I'm gonna fill it up with eight plugs. When you turn it on, four of the outlets are already on from the minute you start it. So if you had a heater plugged into your brand new sump without a drop of water in it, and you plugged in the apex, your heater could just overheat and shatter right there in the sump because there's no water to cool it. So that would happen because one of those outlets is actually physically on because they pre-program some of the most basics. Return pump, heater, protein skimmer, I don't know what else. So you want to know which outlets are going to be used for each item. It's actually not that scary. Um, and like I said, they have created such good tasks built into Fusion, they will show you step by step what to do. Even the Trident, when you're setting it up, the instructions are so easy, it says plug this in. So you go plug it in. And then it says next, and you click it. Now run this tube to this spot. So you run the tube to that spot, and you come back to your, your computer, and you click next. And you go back and forth, or you have your computer next to you, and you're doing it. And you do it step by step, and, you know, a matter of minutes, you'll have things running. So enjoy your products. I mean, why own them? <laughs> you bought them. Use them. It's like buying a new car and saying, I'm scared to take it on the road. It's intimidating because there's so many knobs on the dash. Just uh, don't worry. You'll be okay. And there's a lot of super basic stuff built in. It's intimidating when you try to do advanced programming. And that's something that uh, everyone ends up doing because we want to do more than what is right out of the box. And the ability is there. But it's sort of like saying, I bought a computer and I want to read my email. <laughs> so you do. And it's great. And then you're like, well, I'm also going to browse Facebook. I'm like, okay, so you've got Facebook and email. And then you're like, well... I want to play this game. Like, oh, well, that game requires this much RAM. It needs this kind of video card. You need a better monitor. So you buy some extra gear to enhance your computer to handle that. And then you're like, you know what? I want to make 4K movies. I'm going to need what? And then you, so I see what happened. It went from basic to advanced. And now you're having to buy better and better gear and hooking it all up. It's the same principle with the Apex. You can keep adding more and more gizmos and doodads and, and, and uh, products to do even more to truly become a control freak is what they call the Apex users. But it doesn't have to be scary at the beginning. There's a lot of basic stuff where it's if, when. <laughs> if this is on, do that. If this is this time, do that. It's real simple stuff and it's really easy to navigate the menus and to do stuff one at a time. And after you've been doing it for a little bit, it kind of makes more sense. And then they have a forum on neptunesystems.com with thousands of questions answered and they have a Facebook group where they answer questions every single day. And of course there's customer support if you absolutely don't know what you're doing, but it's not, it's designed to make it easier for hobbyists, not harder. So don't fear it. Go uh, play with your toys. Let's see.
Mike Garcia, Mike Garcia asked, how much is the vacuum attachment? It's a $10 item. It's on the website. It's VCA MaxiJet vacuum attachment. You can probably Google all that and it'll show it. It'll take you right to the right spot on my website. Uh, Greg Hurdle says, you have a copper band butterfly fish. Can you talk about fish hard to take care of, getting them to eat and what else to watch for? Yeah, when it comes to the copper bands, you need to see them eat in the fish store before you buy it. And if they don't eat, don't buy it. That's the first thing. Also, visually inspect that fish really good before you pull out your credit card to buy it. You want to look at it, you, you know, that's already a thin fish, but if its stomach is completely pinched, odds are it's not going to survive. You, it needs to be a healthy specimen. It's not torn up, it's not frayed, it's not scratched, it's not pinched. And like I said, it's got to eat the food they, pro they provide. And if it eats that food, buy that food too. <laughs> Don't just get the copper band and use whatever you have. I have flake food, I have pellet, I have LRS. Use the food that they use because that fish is eating that food and plan to use it in your tank with that copper band for the first couple of weeks. You can use that food plus other foods to create more choices. And that way you uh, might migrate it off of one type of food and into a different food you tend to use more often. But don't expect you may never need that other food. You might have to keep using that food that they used in the first place, whether it's P.E. mysis or it's black worms or uh, mini mysis, whatever it is, that, or brine shrimp. It could be adult brine shrimp. <laughs> you might be breeding and making thousands of brine shrimp every single day to keep your copper band happy. But all that being said, even if you get the copper band to eat, there's no guarantee it's going to survive. They have a really bad rate of success. And... I don't just keep buying fish over and over and over until I get a winner. I, I try it, and if it works out, I'm happy. And if it doesn't, I hold off for a couple of years, and I might try one more time. Maybe the conditions in my tank are better. Maybe there was something going on in the water that affected it. Maybe it just was a bad run. Um, I've had some copper bands that didn't last, you know, two weeks. But this one here I've had now for quite some time. And as you guys know, I talked about on the stream, I also put that cleaner wrasse in my tank. And the cleaner wrasse, uh, I expected it not to do well, and it's still doing well. It's amazing. So those are some of my thoughts on that. Uh, Chase says, do you sell the MaxiJet pumps? I'm curious. I have been waiting for them to come in. I've got an order for you know 20 of those pumps to come in, and they just haven't. They're not here yet. And unfortunately, they're coming from Italy. <laughs> so I'm worried. How much longer do we have to wait? <laughs> I saw Andrea's post just now. I'm sure this was an hour ago, maybe longer. She said, who wants the magazine? Who wants the teepee? <laughs> You're going to love this teepee. It's good enough for me. It's good enough for you. Let's see. <laughs> uh, Jason Coronado says, do you dose phytoplankton? How long can you keep it in the refrigerator? Phytoplankton can last quite a while. Um, it, in the refrigerator, I would say probably would last a month. And what you want to do whenever you open the bottle is you want to give it the sniff test, and if it doesn't smell foul, then it's still good. If it smells uh, spoiled or, or rotten, I wouldn't even chance it. I would just throw it out. I used to dose phytoplankton in my reef, in my previous reef, all the time. I got to the point where I decided I didn't need to anymore, and now with all these other foods that we have, I haven't had the need. But if I were to do it, I'd probably just use Phytofeast from Reef Nutrition because it's super concentrated and I could get whatever size I need, and let's call it, because they have these little bottles, I might get the next size up that's maybe like a quart, and I could probably put in a few tablespoons, and it would be, because uh, it's so dense, 
it's actually a mixture of many different strains of Fido that it would probably do well in my tank. But we've got so many other choices these days, I just haven't felt the need to put it in my tank. Plus, my tank has phosphates, and I know phytoplankton has some phosphate in it. I don't need to add even more to my system. Marquette says, what was Spock's problem and what did the doctor suggest and how is Spock doing? So Spock has a white spot on her right eye. It's like, it's cloudy and it's sort of like glaucoma. And I was wondering if that was something that could be fixed, that it could be polished, it could be removed, you know, not the eye, but the cloud. <laughs> and uh, so I was hoping a professional would say, oh yeah, we deal with this all the time, you know. I mean, I knew it cost money. But I was thinking, you know, a lot of people do crazy things for their dogs and cats. You know, they'll spend $8,000 to cure something wrong with a dog. And I was like, you know, I'm going to have Spock for another 15 years. If I could fix her eye, maybe I should consider, you know, what it's going to cost. And the vet saw it. She didn't see any issue whatsoever. There was no bacterial infection. She wasn't hurting. She wasn't itching it. You know, she's eating. She's healthy. The vet called her a solid five. <laughs> <laughs> which is actually pretty funny because to her, you don't want a fish to be zero and you don't want a fish to be 10. You want it to be five. And she says, Spock is a solid five, which is great. And uh, she wants to come back in six months and look at her again to see if it progressed. Uh, but that was it. That We didn't actually solve what I was hoping to solve. Uh, Chris Cross says, have you ever used HPD food? I don't even know what those initials stand for, so my answer is no. Pickle Boy says, I, how long should I run my lights? They come on at 8 a.m. and they turn off at 8 p.m. That's plenty. You could even go a little less. You could start them later in the day, like 10 a.m. instead of 8 a.m. And you could have them turn off at 9 p.m. You know, and so you'd actually take an hour off of there. But uh, it really comes down to what quality your lights are. And I have a feeling, I know your tank from Club Mila's Reef, and uh, those lights are pretty much, uh, they're not great for corals is what I'm trying to say. They're fine for fish, but I think you need a more intense light for your tank, honestly. Cordell says, how long should I wait to turn on the lights on a new tank? I wouldn't turn them on for the first month while the tank is going through the cycle. And I probably wouldn't even turn them on much until I put some corals in the tank. So if you have fish in the tank and you want to have the lights on for a couple of hours in the evening, just let the normal ambient light that's in the room light the tank all day long. Because if you turn on lights and let the, tanks, the tank lights run nine hours a day, for example, and all you have in there is fish and a pile of rocks and sand, you'll probably just end up with algae in there. And then you're going to have to chase down the algae with the cleanup crew, which is going to lead to another thing. And we want to avoid all of that. So... I would only run the lights as needed. So initially, you're starting your tank. I mean, there's some people that wait two, three months before they turn their lights on. and uh, Or some people start the tank and buy the lights later. <laughs> so the tank can start, you know, getting going. Because it takes a while to get all the bacteria and everything established. But uh, I would just want to have the lights going when there's a need for them. So if you start getting corals, then yeah, you're going to need the lights on. And you're going to need a cleanup crew immediately before the algae gets out of control. Uh, Jonas says, does it make sense to add a whole mix of bacterial additives in order to maximize biodiversity? Uh, two to three different types of nitrifying bacteria starters, two to three different heterotrophic bacteria later. Yeah, you can do that. There's nothing wrong with mixing it up. It actually avoids a mono, uh, mono strain of bacteria. I was trying to think of a certain word, but it won't come to mind. But uh, yeah, we don't want to have one culture of bacteria in the tank, so adding diversity is good. And you do want to know what the different ones are and how they may interact. I wouldn't go over the top, but there's certain ones available. Fritz sells one kind. Um, Prodibia, of course, has another kind. There is the Brightwell. They have some strains of bacteria you can get now to 
compete all kinds of stuff. The Live Rock Enhance from Reef Bright is the one I use that's a bacteria that eats waste that I like. So you do have some all kinds of different choices of different kinds you can add. A lot of people know Microbacter 7, they're very familiar with it and they like to use that. But like you said, if you use two or three different kinds or if you use some this month and in two months you add a different one and then another month you add a different one, you're kind of keeping it interesting and there's a constant battle between the different bacteria, and you avoid one taking over by introducing a new one from time to time. But I wouldn't like mix all three and pour it in. Uh, Jesse says, is bubble algae and vermitid snails a reason not to transfer live rock from my existing system to my new upgraded system? It seems they're both inevitable to some degree. I wouldn't worry about that at all. I would get your rock from the one tank and put them in the next tank because they're nice. And if you have vermitids, break them off and glue their hole shut. If you have bubble algae, scrape it off and remove as much as you can physically. And if you still see some, add some critters in there to eat it. Certain fish eat bubble algae. Uh, so do uh, emerald crabs, so they can work on it. And the vermitids, uh, you know, I mean, I have a couple in my tank, maybe seven. <laughs> and, you know, it's a 400-gallon tank, and I haven't even got my arm wet to remove those. It's like, whatever. But if you had thousands of them, I could say, yeah, I could see why you wouldn't want to put that rock in your tank. Um, Alan says, do you dose trace elements when using a calcium reactor? I'm currently dosing Triton, but looking to change to a calcium reactor. Thanks in advance. You can dose trace elements once a week if you like. Some calcium reactor medias have trace elements embedded in the rock, you know, in the uh, calcified skeleton material we're using, the media. It's, uh, it's not a necessity, but it's a nice thing to do. In addition, if you're doing ICP testing, since you did Triton, you probably were, you're probably aware of certain elements, so you'd have to see what is lacking from those tests to decide if you need to add something that's not keeping up. A lot of the trace elements come in our salt mix, so if you're doing water changes, uh, you're going to be introducing new uh, trace elements each time you do a water change. Again, you were doing Triton, you probably weren't doing water changes either. <laughs> so yeah, it'd be something new for you. Uh, really, you're only going to know if you need to add it based on coral health and ICP testing. Really, it's the only way to know. Uh, Tim says, so when you started out, how long did it take you to get comfortable with acros and more sensitive corals? Did you kill some things learning? I certainly have. <laughs> of course I did. Uh, the first acropora, or I'm sorry, the first SPS coral I bought was Pacillopora. And I stood over those tanks at Macna in 2002, looking at all those beautiful corals and clams, and, I was, and all I had was a 29 gallon with power compact lighting. And I was just like, man, these are so beautiful. What would work under power compacts? And pretty much everything was no, no, no. And I said, will any of these corals work under power compacts? Which power compacts was a type of bulb that's sort of like a weak version of a T5. And the uh, owner told me, you could try Pacillopora. It's a very easy beginner coral. Which nowadays we tend to say an easy coral is bird's nest. So it's kind of along those lines. And I had that little pink uh, Pacillopora. It was really pretty, very furry, and I was really happy with it. And I also got a small clam <laughs> against their wishes because I was like, I really want that clam. And that's when I got my first Maxima, which was that turquoise blue I love so much. And that clam lived for several years. The, uh, the funny thing is, when I moved the clam into my 280-gallon tank from the 29, it went from a tank with power compact bulbs to a metal halide reef and the clam died. I was like, really? I finally give you the real light you deserve and you die? But I had several SPS corals in my 29 gallon tank. That uh, tank is on my website. If you go to my tanks on the tab and then go to past tanks, you can find the 29 gallon. You can see pictures of it and you'll see the corals. There wasn't much room in the tank, so there's only a few SPS corals in there. But I had one colony that started going through all these crazy color changes. 
you know, for a long time it was brown because I didn't know what I was doing and my water quality wasn't great. And then it was more of a turquoise or a green, you know, it was, it was kind of pretty. And then it started going through these weird color shifts. And it was like one color, the next color. I mean, it was sort of like Skittles, like taste the rainbow. I was like, what is going on with these colors? And I just had this feeling that's not a good sign. And within a matter of a couple of weeks, the whole thing went up in smoke. And I was like, yeah, I kind of saw that coming. The color shift was a clear indication this coral was not happy. And that one went out. But that tank also had softies, anemones, mushrooms. Um, there was a lot of other stuff in there, so there was a limit. Then in my 55-gallon aquarium, uh, that was a bigger stride toward a reef tank. There was more space, obviously. I ended up putting in quite a few corals, and a lot of them did quite well. And the 55-gallon aquarium is also documented on the past tanks uh, section of my website. So you could see that. But yeah, I did have some. I don't lose a lot of corals. I, I never have. I mean, I lost some. And I'd save the skeletons, and I was kind of going to do the shelf with dead skeletons. And then I kind of thought, you know, it's kind of morbid. Here are the ones I didn't keep alive. <laughs> and I decided to toss those out. And it was nothing huge. It was like a bird's nest and an acro and a stylo and, you know, things like that. Uh, a tubastria that I lost because I wasn't feeding it properly. But uh, I guess, I mean, my 280 was my pride and joy. It was a beautiful, stunning reef. And uh, it never became tank of the month only because I uh, held off. I was, uh, I was, you know, it was tank of the month quality. And I just kept, and I was the, the editor for Reef Keeping Magazine. And I said, well, let's keep mine on a back burner in case uh, somebody's tank doesn't show up because we had to wait for pictures in their article. And I kept saying, if we don't have it, then we'll drop mine in. And uh, that way we have a backup plan in case, you know, we're lacking an article for the next issue. And I was the editor for that magazine for 13 months. And in that time, we just never did my tank. <laughs> or it would have got included because it was phenomenal. And I've shared that picture a couple times um, of what that tank looked like in its peak. It was gorgeous. And then, you know, in 2010, that tank started leaking. And I had to break it down. And, you know, the 400 is great, but the 280 was amazing. And I would love to have, and I felt super comfortable with those corals. And for the most part, they did really well. There was a couple in there that kind of... Uh, would go up and smoke and I wasn't sure why. And I think that's because back in those days, you know, we just didn't really understand adequately how important alkalinity was. We knew it was an important part, but we didn't realize just how much of a difference. I mean, that's like, you know, people worry, you know, when they first get a tank, they're worried about pH. And when you're doing a reef tank, you worry about alkalinity. <laughs> pH can be whatever. It's alkalinity that matters. And you want that one bulletproof. You know, like that thing has to be rock solid all the time. So I would say, you know, I did lose some mysterious corals occasionally. Just one would go up and smoke for no reason whatsoever. Others would RTN and plenty would just be completely happy. And I'd even attribute it to, well, that coral doesn't do well in my tank, but all these other ones do, so I'll focus on them. Rather than trying to force the issue and make something grow, I just enjoyed the other stuff that uh, was doing well. And uh, yeah, that's when I was comfortable with corals, I guess. <laughs> um, Tim says, will you do a detailed chemist coral chemistry topic on a live stream sometime? Or how about setting the record straight on common reefing myths of various types? Good suggestions. We've talked about pretty much every water chemistry question. I've done streams specifically. I did one stream and completely about alkalinity for the entire hour. I did another one about al uh, calcium and magnesium too. And uh, then, you know, we've talked about everything else under the sun <laughs> through these other streams. This is probably like stream 119 or so. But... Um, Good suggestion. And, you know, talking about myths, I'd have to, you know, give it some thought. But, yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. And then also, uh, just to add to that, I'd really love to do a stream with another person who is a reef chemistry nut, you know, that's on there talking, because I consider myself a hobbyist, first and foremost. I know I'm a business guy, and I, you know, I run a, a small little empire on the web. <laughs> But uh, I really do enjoy uh, some of the stuff, but I want to make sure that my information... Oh, it's, it's a really tricky line. I like to educate 
on a level where the most people can understand what I'm talking about. If I try to do something crazy in depth that's so over their head that they're like, forget it, I don't even want to listen to this, I've lost that group and I don't want to do that. So I'm not saying it has to be simple all the time, but I also, myself personally, don't like it overly complicated. I want to basically just get me the information I need to know so I can apply it and move on with my life. So I can go do the next thing. And uh, so I, you know, I understand the desire for that. And there are some people that are great at it. There's some people that love talking about it, but there's a lot of people that it's, their eyes just glaze over and they're just like, what's on TV? <laughs> you know, this is, I got to go. This ain't going to work for me. So. Uh, Adrian says, is it possible to do a live stream about peroxide for uses and recommendations? Yeah, I guess we could. Um, it's a... I don't know if we have enough, but that can be part of a, uh, a show like I did today. I talked about like 19 things because I had a whole list of things people wanted me to talk about. But it wasn't like a dedicated talk for 45 minutes about a peroxide. <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. I, I can talk a lot, but I don't know if I'm going to have that much information about peroxide. But there are several different uses for it in our hobby that are very practical. So yeah. Greg says, your RO water goes to your kitchen. Does that mean it runs all the time? No. What I did, and I have a video that shows all of this. Um, it's... Uh, a, I think the vid well, if you go to YouTube to my channel and you go to the playlists, find the RODI playlist. And in that list, there's a video about how to get the most out of your RODI system, I think it is. There's a lot of videos like how to install this, how to change that, how to replace this. But there's one about how to use it. And it's about 15 minutes long. And I give an entire tour of how my system is set up. And it's actually still set up like that video. There's very little changes since then. But I've got the RODI system over my washer dryer. It's actually over the dryer. And I have valves that go up through the ceiling and into this room behind me. That's the DI water. I have another line that goes through the wall behind the fridge and under the kitchen cabinet, under the sink, to a bladder tank. And the bladder tank holds three gallons of water. And I have to refill that bladder tank probably three times a week because I use that much water. Um, so I'm using nine gallons of RO water a week for me. <laughs> and then, you know, I, I fill up the reservoir under these, this tank and the frag tank uh, once a week by letting the RO system run DI water. So the way it works is once the bladder tank is full, it puts enough pressure or back pressure on the line that it shuts off the RO system. And I will hear it suddenly go silent. And when I hear that, I then close the valve so no more water can go to the kitchen. That line is shut off now. It's an inline ball valve. I just close that and now it's sealed and no more water will go there. And then the bladder tank will provide water on demand from a spigot on the kitchen counter. And then as I uh, fill up a pot of water for coffee or uh, I'm making oatmeal or you know whatever I have any water for, the, the stream coming out of that spigot slows down. At first it's like ridiculous. It's so much it would shoot out of a glass, right? <laughs> and then, you know, it's slowing down and soon you're like holding something waiting forever, like, okay, it's time to refill the bladder tank. And I'll turn on the RO system. I bleed off the first 90 seconds of water, like I always recommend to you guys. And then I close that valve and I open the valve going to the kitchen and let it refill that bladder tank. So it'll be good for two or three days of water. And then when it's full, I close the line and it's off again. So it's not on all the time. It's on as needed to refill that bladder. And that video will explain it with a lot of visuals, which is so much better than just listening through a voice. Uh, Scott says, how are you doing? How much, you know, do you have much pain? I'm sort of in the same boat. Uh, my eyesight is still dodgy after my brain surgery. I thought I'd ask how you were. Well, thank you for asking. Uh, I've been hurting a lot. Um, and... Uh, a couple days ago, I woke up and it was like migraine day. It was just like, oh, here we go. But somehow I was able to avoid it. You know, I've uh, been really working on eating better. <laughs> I mean, that's something you always hear from the doctor. Exercise and eat better, right? So this year, you know, I was at an all-time peak weight. You know, I, I mean, I was almost the highest I've ever been in my life. And I uh, got motivated to start being better. 
And I went ahead and I used my Apple Watch with my iPhone to track what I was doing exercise-wise. And there was these challenges in the app that would show your, uh, how many, well, I'll show you guys here. It would show how many uh, circles you'd closed. So I'll show you January first, so it'll be easier that way. So here we are in January. Let me turn this off. And when you look on here, you can see how the the pinkish circle was nearly closed or closed every single day. And then the green dot or line was the exercise. And then the blue one is standing up and moving around for a minute every hour. And I'm really good at the red circle and the blue circle. The exercise one I don't like so much. But then you can see from the 19th of January all the way through the 27th, I closed all three circles every single day. Then I took a few days off intentionally because I was planning to do every circle in February, which I did. And I killed myself. <laughs> I made sure to exercise 30 minutes a day every single day for the entire month. I never took a day off. I also had all the movement, uh, which is the red circle or pink circle, where I did that constantly. And it was, uh, I was super sore all the time. I was feeling run down, but I kept at it. I wanted to complete my goal. And then I kept going you know, into March 1st, and then I've, I took a break from the exercise stuff. And I'm still closing my stand circles every single day and my movement circle every single day, which is a move goal of X amount of calories. And I'm also sleeping as best I can. But uh, the point was is that I, I was working on that, and I'm down 17 pounds. And that's got to be better on my body anyway, on my spine. So that's important. Uh, I actually still want to go another 10 <laughs> to feel my healthy self again. But the walking was really good. And uh, if I couldn't, because the weather was too cold, I had to go to the gym. I did that. But at this point, I don't want to go to a gym. I don't want to go to a room full of people with germs, you know, <laughs> uh, coronavirus-wise. You know, I just don't. Meh. But uh, I won wouldn't mind walking. But right now, we have like rain and thunderstorms for like the next seven days straight. So I'm just not gonna sweat it. I'm just focusing on eating better. I'm eating much healthier. I'm eating a lot less sweets. I've been working so much that I actually don't take time to eat junk food in between. I'm not, I was foraging all the time, which is part of the reason I gained so much weight, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, I've, so I am feeling somewhat better, but every day I wake up and it's awful. And it's almost like my sleep causes it. And I'm sure it's, I've tried every kind of pillow under the sun, including no pillow at all. And there's just no no relief without getting the surgery that I need. And uh, that didn't happen. So for now, I'm just kind of focusing on other things and doing my best. But thank you very much for asking. That was nice of you. Um, we're coming up in three hours. There's 280 people on here right now. Wow. Looking for more questions. There's a lot of conversation here. Jeremiah Murray says, that's why I got rid of my Trigger System Sapphire 26 sump. The filter sock is located in the back of the sump in the corner, and it's amazingly annoying to get out, so I didn't change the socks. That's a valid point. And uh, I had a customer recently order a sump from me, and I, he said, well, do I, you know, can I have filter socks? And I said, I can do it, but I don't really recommend it, but I understand why people want it. And so we talked and he decided to go with the method I do, which is the bubble tower in the back corner of the skimmer section. And I said, but what I can do for you is I can put a sock holder in the front right or the front corner of the skimmer section. So if you choose to use a sock, you can reroute your plumbing somehow to that sock instead of using the bubble tower for those temporary deep cleanings and you can reach in and get the sock in and out of your sump because it's right in the front. And he says, I love that idea. Yes, do that. So I'm doing that for him. And he can do whatever he wants with this plumbing. But uh, the uh, idea of anything that's in your sump when you're trying to be able to work on it, you have to be able to reach it. And like uh, Jeremiah was saying, I couldn't get to it. Because think about it. It's not only in the back corner. And there's a lid, you know, which is accessible. But a lot of us have plumbing going along the back. And we have wires and dosing and all that. And there's our protein skimmer with a collection cup. So at the very least, you got to remove the collection cup, then get the lid off, pull that sock out, feed the new sock in, put the cup back. And that's if nothing else is in your way. If you have any kind of cables or tubes or anything else, 
it can be a real hassle trying to get something out of a spot that's difficult to reach in. That's why you see some other sumps that are built where they have the drains go in the back and they have like a, a compartment that goes to the front with a lid where you can reach and get the socks from the front. And that makes more sense. And I've had to make a few sumps that way for certain customers and they requested it, so I did it. And it's, it's nicer because you can remove the sock and you could even put in one of those cups. Some people like to do that instead and to put uh, some kind of fleece material or batting in there to catch particulates. Uh, for me, I just, I don't want any of that. <laughs> and the only reason I'm running the Clarice is because they talked me into it, and it definitely is pulling stuff out. I mean, the, the roll on there is just disgusting what it's pulled out. And uh, it's only doing a part of my water. Part of my water goes to the refugium, part goes to the skimmer, and part goes to the Clarice. So it's not, you can't even say 50% is going through the Clarice. It's not. There, I'd probably say, I don't even know. Let's say 200 gallons an hour goes through it, maybe. <laughs> I don't even know. I can't even measure the flow rate because it's a drain and uh, it's going into one inch pipe. So, and it's quiet. So I'm going to assume maybe it's 150 gallons an hour is going in there. That might be overly ambitious. It could be a hundred an hour. It's just, it trickles in there. The rest of it's going to the refugium in the skimmer zone. But it is helping pull stuff out. Uh, Rayman says, what type of lights do you run and what do you think of the Kessel 360X? Okay, first of all, I'm going to answer the second half. The 360X, I love the look and I think it's probably a great light. Um, and if you use the Bluetooth dongle that plugs in on the top, you can control it with your phone and that's great. And they have a nice arm that's adjustable to put it right over your tank. So that's a great light. And I've seen it at many shows and every time I saw it, I was like, I love that look. But uh, for myself, I have metal halides on my tank and they provide all the growth my tank needs. I'm a metal halide guy. I've been like that forever. I'm one of the few holding out that have just stuck to it, and I have tons of bulbs left. I have ballasts extra. You know, <laughs> I have zero reason to change mine out for something else. So I'm just enjoying it. Uh, 508... Jay Fisher says, how do I add a second DI unit to my RODI? I actually don't recommend that to anyone. And the reason being is if the first one is not doing the job, you need to replace the DI, correct? If you add a second one, what you're doing is you're creating a safety net. Like if number one doesn't work, number two will take over. Well, how, how often are you around this RODI system? I mean, if it's in your home, near your tank, you're there every day. If a DI is spent and it has to be replaced, it takes 30 seconds to swap it out. If you're buying cartridges, if you're packing it yourself, I guess it takes you two and a half minutes to swap it out. But when you run them in succession, when the first one is done, it can even start to release some TDS into the water. So let's say it comes in at three and it's coming out at seven because the DI is completely done and that's not even, it's even starting to release some. The seven goes into your new DI, your second one, and you're actually eating it up more quickly than if you just had the three going into a new DI. So the point of a double DI initially, I'm sure this was the main reason it came up, was for maintenance accounts where they visit the tank every two weeks or once a month. And those guys weren't there to change the DI and didn't trust the homeowner to do it. So they set it up so that way it would be always good, no matter what. And when they came back in two weeks to a month, they could swap out whatever needed to be replaced. But in the meantime, they didn't have to make an emergency run up there because there was a problem with the DI. Makes total sense. For a maintenance account, for something you're gonna visit occasionally, sure, running extras and it's gonna cost you more in DI resins, so be it. But when you're a hobbyist in your own home with your own RODI system, I see no reason whatsoever to add a second one to the first one because the first one's doing the job. And if it suddenly isn't, change it just like anything else you do in your, if you have a light on the ceiling, do you put multiple lights in case one stops working? <laughs> you just have a light and when it stops working, you put a new bulb in it and you just keep going. So that's why I don't recommend it. It's just, I think that you'll end up wasting more DI because the first one's gonna start ruining the second one quicker than to just run one. So, but I see a lot of people that do it. And if you wanna add a second one, you can. You can put two, I mean, if yours is like standalone or if you don't, as a matter of fact, I sell a standalone unit. It is part of my kit, but people sometimes buy just that and it's 50 bucks. 
and it comes with a DI in it. And if you want one, I can ship one to you. But uh, I just don't see the point. Just change the DI when it's used up. Uh, the Prodigal Sun says, I have a refugium with Ketomorpha that's growing more hair algae than Keto. I'm using the Kessel H380. Well, I would remove the hair algae, and then hopefully the Keto would do better. The other thing that you might need to do is dose iron. Ketomorpha needs iron. Um, it's, uh, it also needs calcium. <laughs> it's, uh, it's dependent on those two. Also, it does not need 24 hours of light. So if your light is running longer than nine hours a day, I would change the schedule down. Uh, Ketomorpha also can tumble, uh, that, like with some kind of power head to where it's turning. That helps a little bit. And uh, if you just have a small amount, it's going to take forever to grow. You need more of it to basically make it do its thing. And then lastly, you need enough nutrients in the tank for the Ketomorpha to thrive. And uh, you have hair algae growing, so there must be some nutrients. But... Uh, those are some of the thoughts that come to mind in your situation. Uh, Two Guys Gaming says, I want to mount my RODI unit to the wall. Should I mount a 2x4 first and then mount the unit to that? Something like that would be ideal. It doesn't have to be a 2x4. It could be a sheet of plywood that's bolt, you know, screwed into the studs. And now you can put the panel anywhere. You can paint the board the same color as the wall, so it's just like a raised solid surface. And you'll have a spot to you know, screw anything in there, which is really nice. What I did, I used to work in carpentry, in construction, and I did trim carpentry, which means I put in all the shelves and all the windowsills and hung the doors and put in the attic stairs and all those kind of things. And we built these elaborate closets, which used what we called cleats, which was a long wooden board against the back wall. And then there was two... Uh, rails coming out this way and then you'd put the shelf on top and this would support the full shelf and then you'd have a metal uh, angle iron to keep the middle from dipping and on the ends you put those sockets to put a closet rod to hang your clothes on and that shelf assembly is exactly what I did with my RO system As a matter of fact I'll show that picture now so you can see how mine is screwed in because uh, I just did that picture of my RO unit so here is that picture I'll turn it sideways. And you can see the wooden board across the back and across the side. And then there's the shelf on top. And of course, then it was uh, caulked and painted and sealed. And then I could screw straight into that nice thick board. And that's a really nice way to do stuff that keeps things solid and, and reliable. And you don't have to worry about anything going wrong. These people are sending me messages during the stream and it shows up on the stream. Ah! And my phone said to do not disturb. I don't know why these things still can push notifications through. All right. Glenn Johnson says, any suggestions on combating Aptasia? Tried the laser, but most seem to be in awkward angles, and I cannot kill them completely. I think they are multiplying. You should try f Aptasia, And uh, a lot of people are using it and really enjoying it. And uh, it seems to do a great job. It basically creates like a hard shell coating that... Whatever's under that coating or frosting just dies. And so you have to be careful not to get on your corals. But you just hit those Aptasia, and in about three days, you can break away that white shell or break it up in the tank, and uh, there'll be no Aptasia there anymore. So if, that's on my website. Jeremiah, I wouldn't recommend that. I mean, I know what you're saying, and there are certain inserts. They're even the kind that looks like a curly cue that screws in a sheetrock. But an RO unit empty is 18 pounds. And once you add water into the system, you could be more like 25 to 30 pounds. That's a lot to hang off of two screws on a sheetrock wall. So I would definitely recommend using some kind of a backer board that's screwed into the actual studs of the walls as that would because the holes in the RO system never line up with the studs. 
you might get one stud and then you'll get nothing. And you know, so now you're kind of putting all your hopes off of one screw. Um, I definitely recommend a solid board. I've always recommended that. Uh, plus, even more so, when it's time to remove the housings to change the filters, you turn off the water pressure, you know, you turn off the water, so it's depressurized. You open the valves after the unit so that you hear it hiss. And then you take a wrench and you twist and you're racking the unit to loosen that housing. And especially like the single DI stage I have, that's four screws going into whatever. Let's say you put them into anchors in the sheetrock and the wall, um, but not the stud. You twist, I guarantee you rip the entire thing off the wall. So if you screw that into a board that's screwed into the wall, you don't have to worry about that. You'll, you'll be able to remove the housings without a problem. But yeah, I would never just tell anyone to put an RO system directly into sheetrock. Uh, John says, if I use two-part to keep parameters stable, I currently dose alkaline at night and calcium in the morning. Okay, that's backwards. Alkaline in the morning when the pH is low, calcium in the afternoon because alkaline is already been dosed in the morning. And then do I need to dose less two-part when using Kalkwasser? Yes, uh, you may need to use less, but the only way to know is to test your water frequently to see. So you can test daily, but you need to stop dosing backwards. Alkaline in the morning, calcium in the evening. That's the way to do it. Kevin says, can you recommend a cleanup crew for dinos? You. You are the only cleanup crew that can handle it without dying. <laughs> Dino flagellates are toxic, and uh, nothing cleanup crew-wise will eat it. And if it does get on it, it dies, which only adds to the dino flagellate problem because now another thing has died. Some kind of a snail, it rots, it adds phosphate nitrate, it fuels the dinos. So no, there's nothing out there that eats dino flagellates that we know of. Uh, Josh says, I'm wondering if I can mix cleaner and peppermint shrimps together in a 60-gallon. Yeah, they'll be okay. Eh, there's a possibility some cannibalism may happen at some point, but I have had cleaner shrimp and peppermint shrimp in the same tank, and there was no interaction between them. If, I used to have a cleaner shrimp and a coral banded shrimp, and they were always at the opposite end of the tank at all times. <laughs> this one came across, this one went the other way. And they avoided each other like the plague. It's very interesting. And then... Back to that upgrading from the 29 gallon to the 280, the day I was moving everything over from the 29 gallon, the, you know, I'm looking in the tank and I could see the coral banded shrimp holding half of the cleaner shrimp in one claw and the other half in the other claw. He'd ripped it in half. I was like, I was literally moving into a huge home and you murdered it that morning. I was like, wow. And that was sad. So there are times where certain creature creatures might eat others, but... Cleaner shrimp and peppermint shrimp don't have a problem. An arrow crab might go after a peppermint shrimp, possibly. Coral band shrimp might go after another shrimp. But there's so many beautiful ones. There's the blood shrimp, there's the cleaner shrimp, and the, the skunk. Um, peppermints, of course. Um, and it's just kind of nice to have a nice variety. And sometimes they all get along fine, and sometimes somebody suddenly gets really hungry. So, you know, there's no absolute guarantee, but yeah, what you're saying should work. Uh, Rayman says, what do you think about the Kessel 360 lighting up a 220 and how many? Um, I think each 360X is for a 2x2 two two area. So if your tank is uh, 8 feet long and 2 feet wide, you'd need 4. If your tank is 2.5 feet wide and 6 feet long, you might need 6. Or you could do 5 and kind of stagger them like a zigzag, like a W, <laughs> if you're looking from above. Uh, it would come down to what looks best to your eye and does well in the tank. You might start off with three and then see if you need two more, that kind of thing. Or you might do three and then say, you know what, I could shift two over and have a fourth and, I'm, and that's plenty.
Uh, Kurt says, is there a reason people seem to lean away from using glass lids and more towards screen tops? Yeah, we don't use glass lids on reef tanks. And the main reason is because we don't want to inhibit oxygen exchange. We want our surface rippling. We want it off gassing and oxygen getting in. Our, a lot of reef tanks are just wide open. And all the exhibits you see when you go to public aquariums, wide open. There is nothing on top. People like to put glass lids on top for the main reason, I think, in the beginning was it was a place to put your light. <laughs> you put the lid on there, you put the light on top of it, and it's done. You lift the lid, you put food in, and you close it. Also, a lid inhibits evaporation because people think, oh, I have to re replace my water because it evaporated. If only I had a glass lid, that would solve it. There's nothing wrong with evaporative cooling and uh, you should have no reason to fear it. So in my tanks, they're all, I mean, everything's open. This is open, the frag tank's open, the 280 was open, the 60 gallon is wide open, it's a rimless tank. Um, all these tanks are open to, to air and oxygen exchange. And then if you are avoiding, if you're worried about fish jumping out, that's why people get screen tops, because the screen keeps the fish from bouncing out, it hits the top and ricochets back into the water, better than landing on the floor, right? And uh, it still allows the gas exchange with no issue whatsoever. So that is why we go away from the glass tops. I think glass tops might, I don't even know for sure, but I'm thinking might be preferred by freshwater people, possibly. Uh, RJ says, what's a good way to add a coral beauty with a clown that loves his own space and killed one off the first week I had it. Uh, certain clownfish are very aggressive. The maroon clownfish is one. The uh, uh, Clarky is another. Looks like a bulldog. And when you have a very aggressive fish like that, it's hard to introduce something else to the tank if the tank is too small. If it's a bigger tank, you might not have a problem. You may have to remove the clownfish temporarily and then bring it back into the tank afterwards. But if that clownfish is already living in an anemone, I wouldn't touch it. Uh, I might just, I don't know, <laughs> might just not get any more fish. I might just say, well, that's what I got because I like this clown. Uh, Chris says, can you explain the difference between the two Apex systems on your site? <clears throat> if I get the base unit now and upgrade it as needed, or should I save up for the $800 system? So the $500 system is a basic Apex minus a couple of probes, and I think minus a couple of plugs, like uh, outlets. And if you decide later you want to use those probes and you need those additional outlets, there's a module that you can purchase. The thing is, is that when you choose to do that, you'll, have to, you'll end up spending a little bit more than the $800 system. So up front, you're saving some money. You only paid $500, and you've got an Apex system to go with. And then later on, you're like, well, I did want that, and I think it ends up you end up spending like $880 or, or $890 to actually match the full system that's $800. <laughs> so it's a little cheaper to get the full system, but I understand what you mean. And uh, that's why I offer both on my site. But this is not like a monitoring only one. BRS was selling one for like 200 bucks, And literally, it was just like a way to put probes in the water and just get a reading, and you couldn't control anything. It was brain only. And you couldn't tie it into a trident. or I, I think it was super limited. And uh, I would never have bought that. <laughs> I'm sure there's people out there like, oh, I love it. It's fantastic. And I was like, oh, no, no, not for me. I, I need the ability to plug things in and have my Apex turn them on and off. I mean, if I show you this, let me shrink this box down. So we'll go to, oh, here we are. It was ready for you guys. <laughs> now I'm going to shrink this down too. There we go. So this is my uh, Apex system right now. And there's a ton of features in here. And there's a lot of gauges. And this, I only use half the stuff. There's people out there who use way more than I do. But like right here in the middle. Okay, so let's start on the left. We've got temperature, pH, and ORP. And this is a graph for the last 24 hours. And if you click on any of these, I'll get a full graph that shows me the last week of what's been going on. Underneath is the vortex for my cube, for the anemone cube. And right now it's at 71% in lagoon mode. 
Then I've got my three buttons, which the blue button is for if I do a water change, the white button was to control a light that I disconnected, and then my feed button I use every single night when I feed the tank. The feed button turns off my protein skimmer and my return pump for 10 minutes. And then after 10 minutes, and it also slows down the cube flow to 10%. Then after 10 minutes, the cube flow goes back to whatever the schedule is supposed to be, the return pump turns on, and five minutes after that, the protein skimmer turns on. Then we have the two EB832s, which are the power strips. And this one here is showing right now that I've got a refugium light running at 35 watts. I've got this Lumalite blue, which I've actually, I'm trying to remember what that is, because <laughs> I don't know. It's, I've got two MP60s, and for some reason this one always reads zero, but it's obviously on, so that's not true. And they're using 14 watts of power. I've got the return pump using 134 watts. The protein skimmer is one pump is running 44 watts, so the second pump is doing the same. My CO2 tank is not running, and my cooling fans are not on. And then this is the other 832, and this has the algae turf scrubber that's turned off, so there's no wattage being used. Empty outlets. The dosing pumps down here. And then I have a Salindi probe. I show amperage measurements of power being used. This is going to be my lighting right here, I think. Um, this one right here was probably heaters. And then we go to the middle. We've got the XHOs that are turned on. The refugium is turned on. The Lumilite Blue is on. The um, MP60s are on. The return pump is on. The skimmer is on. The Swabi is off. You can see the word off right here. But it's all set to auto. It's very important when you set up an Apex that everything be on auto. Because if you... I'm sorry, I left this on the screen the whole time. Turn this off. Uh, the... Uh, if you have anything set to on, like this, it will never turn off. So now the skimmer float is on, it's going to shut off my protein skimmer. So I just heard the skimmer turn off, and now if we look over here at the 832, in a probably 60 seconds or so, the skimmer power is going to be zero. <laughs> and that's intentional, because I don't want it to overflow the collection cup, or the waste collector. Uh, but if you, have everything, if you ever have anything set to on, it will stay on forever. It will never do any commands. It will only be on because you told it to be on. When you put on auto, then what it does is it will turn on and off based on what's going on in the conditions in the tank. I've got the cooling fans. Here are my three heaters. Here's my moonlighting that runs for 30 minutes at night. These are switches to toggle the, uh, uh, the twin arc bulbs on and off to switch from 10K to 20K lighting. These were all brand new from last night, which I already discussed. Then over here is the trident showing the current readings, which shows alkalinity, calcium, and magnesium. And it shows the graph of what's going on. And if I click it again, it shows how much is in each of the reagent bottles. And if I click it one more time, it shows how much is in the waste connect container and how many tests are left to run A, how many tests are B and C. So I've got 88 tests left of alkalinity. I have 121 of calcium and magnesium because I just filled those up. Then this is some code for my calcium reactor. This is the temperature of the frag tank. I'm sorry, pH of the frag tank and the temperature of the frag tank. And then the frag tank has a skimmer. It has a refugium light. It has a smart auto top off. It has a Nero 5 for circulation, a neotherm for heat, dosing pumps, and then a little circulation pump for under the dosing pumps, and then the return pump. And then over here is ATK stuff, um, which is top off. And in the middle here on the lower section, it shows my email alerts and my alarms for if there's a problem. So if there was a problem with my tank, if the temperature is too hot, if the alkalinity was too low, if a button was impressed, if any of the power bars are lacking power, if there's a leak, if the Trident has an error, it sends me a message instantly. So that is why I like the Apex so much. It's way more than a monitor. It is actually doing a lot of stuff. All right, let's see where I left off. Uh, Eric Smith says, do you have to keep an RODI system under water pressure once it's hooked up and being used once a week? Mine drains half the water when the water valve is off. Yes, what you want to do the RODI system should have an auto shutoff valve on the top, which is this weird white thing on the very back that's small, you know, it's about three and a half inches long maybe, and like two inches by two inches, and it's got four tubes going into it. 
And that thing is designed that when the system is pressurized, it will then shut off the, dr the waste water going out. So, and so you can leave it pressurized. So if you turn on the cold water, now pressure goes into the RO system, you open the valve and you make RODI water, then when you close that valve, the back pressure will fill up the system until the auto shut off turns off the system. And that's it, it's off. And it won't come on again until you open the valve for the RODI water. And if for some reason it doesn't turn off, the auto shut off valve has to be replaced. But by doing that, you don't have to see your housings lose water and have to deal with that whole burping of the air out of the system again each time you start it up fresh. You want the entire system to be full of water, pressurized, and stopped. And you definitely want to run it once a week. That's perfect. If you run it once a week, there's no stagnation issues. Some people want to not turn it on for a few weeks, and that's a terrible plan. Definitely turn it on at least once a week. Mine runs about twice a week. You guys putting the at Mila's Reef has really helped a lot in finding your questions in here. Uh, David says, how's your cleaner rest doing? Uh, let's see. <laughs> it must be on the back side of the tank right now. I saw it just before the stream. Yeah, I don't know. I don't see it right now. Um, Sam says, with the quarantine of various parts of the world, any tips for stocking up on reef tank supplies to keep us going if we are quarantined indefinitely? Um, the things you, you're going to have to think about what your expendables are, the things you're going to have to replace. RODI filters, carbon, fish food, salt mix, uh, test kits, in case yours are getting kind of old and you're getting close. I mean, the things you're, you're going to expend that you have to be replaced, those are things you have to think about immediately. Um, I can't really think of anything else off the top of my head right now. I mean, I mean, it could even be things like coral glue, frag plugs, coral dip, you know, uh, medications for fish. But I don't think this is going to be a forever situation. I, I, hope, I, I hope it's not. I hope this is just a situation that's going to go on for six, eight weeks, and then kind of things settle down and we're okay. I mean, that's my hope. I think the biggest problem with this uh, virus is that they don't have a cure for it. Like, there's not an actual pill or IV solution that you can take, like chemo or something, to really nuke it. You know, it's like, right now, it's stay away and don't catch it is the number one rule. And then if you do, you have to be X amount of sick to get into the hospital. So yeah, I would try to look at stocking up on things that are expendables. Or uh, consumables, things that you're going to have to get soon. Like, for example, the fleece roller for your clerisy. Or you're going to be without a clerisy for a while because you can't get any more rolls. But the other problem is that everyone buys everything, you know, and then you can't find anything because it's all sold out everywhere. Uh, Tim says, can urchins get ick? Well, ick is a... Uh, a broad term for a pest that sucks on fish. So an urchin could potentially carry it, but it shouldn't be, you know, infested with ick itself. Uh, you can't dip it in anything. <laughs> the only thing you could do is put it in a quarantine tank and see how it does, I guess, you know, for a while, but it might starve itself to death waiting for food in this quarantine tank. I don't know that I'd worry, but I mean, if you see a system full of ick and you're you know, you might not want to take the chance because some of the water could carry ick into your tank, and that's not good. Even with acclimation and even the tank transfer method where you go from bucket to bucket to bucket and then finally into your tank. I don't know. I guess if, if the tank had fish... I mean, I saw a vendor at one of the trade shows years ago, and he had this yellow tank swimming everywhere, and it was just coated with the most ick I'd ever seen on a fish in my life. So I stood there for five minutes taking pictures of it because it was insane. <laughs> there was no way I was buying anything out of that tank because of that fish. That's my choice.
Uh, Mark says, what is the typically most peaceful tang? I was told the bristletooth tang is the most commonly peaceful, but not exactly the prettiest. Are there peaceful tangs that are somewhat of a nice color? Um, the yellow tang is sort of docile. The hippo tang, of course, is skittish, uh, but and can be kind of a little bit, I mean, it's very colorful and blue. Um, also called the regal tang. Um, and it also comes down to the size of your aquarium. The smaller the tank, the harder it is on the tang. And so we want to make sure that we have the right size aquarium for the tang you want to buy. Um, but the coal tang is, I think is a pretty fish and uh, it may not be the color you want. I guess you have to say, well, what color tang do you want in your tank? Number one, and then see if we can find you a peaceful one. But uh, aggressive is going to be the Sohal and the purple. I think I mentioned that earlier in the stream. The Nasso seems to be pretty easy going, but it's essentially a gray fish with some color on the top and on the lips. Oh, there's a lot of good tang suggestions. Several people talked about uh, the Tom and I, and uh, I saw another one here. What else did I see here just a second ago? Oh, the convict tang was another one. Yeah, I've never kept that one. Akan Lord is updating us. Remember that mystery polyp I discovered near my sarcophyton coral, which is a leather coral. I fed it, now it's tripled in size and consists of five polyps. Looks like a favia. Cool! That's awesome. I love hitchhikers. Uh, Osama, if I put a camera filter, or maybe you meant for the anemone cube, uh, the thing is, I will be the weird color. <laughs> That's why we're not using a filter and you just got the, the soft glow back there. But uh, you might have been commenting when I was moving the camera closer to that tank over there. Uh, Tip and Turtle says, any word on the two little fishies calcium reactor media? There's no word on the reborn. I didn't even bother. I was going to email him on Friday, and I decided not to bother them yet. I think I'll try it this week. But I do have the reborn little in stock. If you need a bag, let me know. I've got the four kilogram bag. Um, but the big one's out of stock for now. Uh, Unfiltered Reefer says, what settings did you adjust on your Apex ATO V2 to get it working properly? I remember you said you were having troubles in the beginning. I was. I was having some issues. The first thing I did was I got rid of the when statement uh, because the when was sort of like this timeout thing that if it, I think it was when the a ATKs are running this long, turn it off. And that way you wouldn't flood your system with too much RO water. And I got rid of that and it completely solved the problem. But I do have some modified code in there. I can send you the code later to be easier than trying to explain it to you on the stream. But uh, it's it's pretty much bulletproof. I've had no problems with it. I'm still running version one. I don't have the V2. I sell the V2 and I'm still using version one because my pump is still working. My sensors are still working. They haven't rusted. There's no, all those things you hear people talk about didn't happen to me. And I have extra parts here anyway. So I mean, even if a sensor went bad, I have another one ready to go to swap out. And I even have the PMUP in case I have to swap out that too. But I, my code, it's, well, I'll show it to you. I don't care. Let me give me a second here to pull it up. Um, this might be my code. Nope, that's not it. <laughs> I have multiple. I think I have some virtual switches too, which kind of affects this. So we'll do this really quick. So this is my code. And so fallback off. Set is off. If the ATO low sensor is open, which means that uh, it is submerged, it is open, it's like it's in air, then turn on the pump. If the high sensor is closed, which means it's covered with water, then turn it off. And then I have this ATK timer, which is a virtual switch. I also have, if there's a leak, I want to shut off my ATK entirely because I if something's leaking I don't want the top off to keep running trying to replace lost water So I have a leak sensor on the uh, next to the sump on the rubber mat And then I have this defer command and I believe the way these defers work is that if um, 
the sensor has to be in that state for at least 10 seconds before it'll send a signal. And then I have the minimum time where it, the ATK actually runs every hour and a half. Instead of running every 30 minutes or whatever it was originally set to, I spread it out to where it runs every 90 minutes throughout the day. Because every time it came on, I could hear water squirting into the sump through the, the way it operates, and I didn't want to hear it. <laughs> I, like, I keep emphasizing how I've made my tank so quiet that you know anything that makes a sound now is like so loud. And uh, so I decided to break that up some. So that's my code. And then the AKT, ATK timer is um, waiting for this to come back. Hmm, that's the virtual switch I talked about. It's set to off. Why did I need that? I don't remember. It's set in here. If the timer is on, then off. I don't remember why I have that there. Sorry. Sometimes I have to scratch my head for a while to figure out what I did. And then I added this one, the ATA, ATO open alert. That's if it's been open for too long. Like it's been running this long, I want to send me an alert, actually send me a message that what it is is it has not topped off water. The float switch has been exposed to air for a hundred minutes. So it sends me a text and then I can manually turn on the ATK for my phone, even if I'm out of town and I'll set a timer on my phone to like in 10 minutes to remind me to turn it back off again. So that's how I have mine set up. All right, asked and answered. A lot of times this kind of code, you can discuss it with others in the uh, Neptunes group and they'll help you get things straightened out. Andrew Peters says, can you help me? My Deltek skimmer keeps over skimming and I don't know why. When you say over skimming, do you mean overflowing or do you mean it's doing such a fantastic job that your tank looks perfect? If it's overflowing, it's possible your skimmer is sitting in too much water and needs to be lifted up a couple of inches so it's sitting at the proper depth. <coughs> but uh, you'd have to give us more information to answer that. It also could be something you're adding to the water is affecting it. <laughs> Chad, you're very welcome for the coaster. I'm glad you like it. Uh, Ryan's asking a question about phosphate. So he used the Red Sea phosphate testing and it was measuring 0 0.08 to 0 0.12 for many months. Then changed to the HANA Ultra Low, I'm sure you mean that one, and discovered it's 0.26 phosphate and Red Sea shows 0 0.12. Which one to believe? Well, I don't use either of those, but I believe that after you get your reading, then you have to do some kind of conversion as well to find out what your number actually is to make them all equal. Uh, the reason I don't use ultra low anything is because my phosphates are never ultra low. <laughs> they, they are normal phosphates. And so I just use regular ones. If, uh, let me ask you this, rather than, you know, debating this to death, and I'm sure some people would love to hammer this out, but if you used Red Sea and you were happy with it and your numbers were good and your tank looked good, why did you switch to something else that's making you now have doubts? That's my question. And, you know, you might just say, well, didn't work out for me. Maybe I can sell this to someone else. Yeah, someone might buy that kit that doesn't have one. But what to believe? I guess the best way would be test with your Red Sea, test with a HANA, send off an ICP test. When that test comes back, compare it to the two results you wrote down somewhere, saving it for that day, and see what the ICP came back with. And that way you'll have an answer to which kit was more accurate. Um, Tim says that he has a fighting conch that will slingshot itself around the tank and over the rocks. Yeah, they do that. Um, they can be very quiet moving through the stuff or they can get, you know, kind of move very quickly <laughs> and jerk around. It's kind of fun. But uh, when you have a conch that's uh, near another one, they could fight. That's why they're called fighting conchs. 
he also followed up with the conch stretches way out and then flings the shell. Yeah, it seems like it's trying to get somewhere more rapidly rather than just crawling across the glass. That, that happens sometimes. Maybe it doesn't like the surface of the terrain it's going over, you know, the substrate. Or uh, it's trying to get toward or away from something rapidly. It could be, but it shouldn't do it all the time. That's not very normal. You might check on and see what it does at night. Uh, Michael says, how do you feed the anemone tank? Each anemone or do you broadcast? I feed the fish and that's it. I never feed the anemones. I don't actually, I just, I feed in that mixture of frozen food every night and it goes everywhere. And then the flake food that goes in during the daytime blows around and the fish eat and the fish poop all over the anemones and that's how they get their food. And then once a week, I try to get twice a week, but it's really once a week I do Bene Reef, which is the uh, very fine food that goes into the entire system and clouds the water. And so they get a chance to inhale food that way as well. <clears throat> uh, Ryan says, is there any chance a copper band won't eat a Maxima clam? I have a copper band and would love a clam. Wonder if large clams would be safe. Yeah, see, that's the question. Will the copper band mess with it? It may not, or it might pick at it. It's kind of 50-50. You could start off with the clam in the tank and make some kind of a cage over it out of egg crate to protect it, you know, with enough space that the snout of the copper band can't reach in far enough and see what happens initially and then maybe reveal the clam and kind of sit back and watch. But even then, maybe if you reveal it, the fish might say, huh, that's something I haven't been able to reach until now. Maybe check it out. So there is a chance that may not work out, huh? I don't know. Um, I have a copper band. I've been planning to add some clams. I didn't really give it a second thought. I think uh, butterflies aren't, you know, I mean, they're interested in worms. Uh, they're not like clam eaters per se. There are other butterflies that will go at clams, but I don't think copper bands are known for that. Chase says, what is the best way to cut quarter inch acrylic sheet for a tank lid? I just need it 17.25 by 44 inches. Well, a table saw would be ideal. And you want to use a, a very fine blade, uh, like a paneling blade, because this is a one-time cut. If you're going to do a lot of acrylic cutting, I would say to buy a carbide bit um, ATB blade, which is alternate tooth blade or alternate tooth bevel blade. And uh, those are really great because the teeth are like this as they spin through the acrylic, but the blade is thin in the center. So the blade isn't touching the acrylic. The teeth cut a wide enough kerf that it doesn't make contact and rub and melt the side of the acrylic as you're pushing it through the saw. And that would be the ideal way to, to cut it. And if you, I mean, it's always, like you said, and you know what, where you buy acrylic, like if you buy it from an, a, a, a plastic supplier, they might just cut you the exact size you need and you just pay a few extra bucks and just, you don't even cut it at all, they'll do it. And yeah, Nick is right. Acrylic will bow. Um, so polycarbonate is a better choice. Polycarbonate is a different material, looks like acrylic, but doesn't act like acrylic. If you use clear acrylic, it's going to curl on the wet side, the damp side, and the top's going to be dry. So it's going to do this weird banana shape. And then you're going to flip it over, and then it's going to curl the other way. And you're going to be every week flipping it, flipping it, flipping it, wiping it down, flipping it, wiping it down, flipping it. And it's going to be forever. Polycarbonate at least stays straight. And you're 100% right. Uh, Angel says, how many anemones do you have in there? I don't know, 30, 40, something like that. And Jake says, am I too late for the drawing for the Crow Magazine and the TP? Yes, you're too late. <laughs> um... <laughs> Tim says, if Andrea was holding a football like Lucy for you to kick, do you think she'd pull it out at the last second? Dude, I don't play sports. She'd be holding it all day long. <laughs> I'd be looking out the window, sipping my hot chocolate, and she'd still be out there holding the football. And I would just smile. That's great. Um, Lee says, how many different tangs can I add to the tank at one time? How big is the tank and what size are the tangs and what type of tangs? 
So he had to ask you three questions to answer your question. Uh, Russ says, are the RODI systems ready to ship or is there a wait? There is not a wait. I uh, got my pallet this week and I shipped out nine by Friday. <laughs> I've been very busy this week building those and I, shipped, I sold a couple more over the week and I'll be building them and they'll go out on Monday. So if you want to buy one, yeah, it'll go out on Monday. Kevin Riley says, the Trident Unicorn is nice to add to my system. What are your thoughts on how often to run calibration? Basically, you want to run calibration when you replace all three reagents. So each time you open up a two-month box, that's when you're going to do it. Typically, it was told us that you had to run it for two days and then do calibration. But now the new boxes say to install the reagents, run it three times, then calibrate, and then you're good to go. So uh, I just actually replaced some of my re reagents this week, but it wasn't all three at once. So it's still waiting till the next time to calibrate, I guess. We've been at it for three hours and 45 minutes. My cup of coffee is so cold. I need to get a mug warmer, keep my coffee warm during these streams so I can sip and make noise on the microphone. Uh, Naz says, I have a 10-gallon nano tank, and I've been cycling my tank for two months now. I have six snails, two hermit crabs, and two clowns. <clears throat> I'm seeing a lot of brown substance on top of my sand bed. Help. Well, the brown substance could be diatoms. And diatoms are basically food for bacteria. Uh, you might try adding more live bacteria to your tank, like Microbacter 7, and maybe that'll help. You may need to increase flow across the sand if it's just detritus. I mean, you, you said you've been cycling. You, have, you don't have any other livestock. There's no fish. There's nothing else in there at this point. Are, have you been running the lights or not? Matthew says, what lights are best for small tanks? 60 liters. That sounds like 15 gallons that are cheap. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I haven't run a tank that small in so long. I haven't looked at lights for a tank that small. Uh, William says, if you're quarantining corals for a week, do the quarantine require feeding? Yeah, you would want to feed your corals in that quarantine tank somehow. Uh, you know, if you have your corals in a quarantine tank, if there's any fish and you're feeding the fish, they'll get some food. If it's just corals, you'll probably need to put in some kind of maybe a broadcast food once or twice. Or you could stop flow and you can actually turkey-based food toward them on the uh, directly on the corals and give it 15 minutes or so and then restart your filtration. Oh, there's a lot of conversation that doesn't include me. That's great. Thanks, guys. <laughs> um... Rooster, I saw this question earlier, but I don't know what you're asking. You said you can put clamps with anemones. Maybe you mean clams? Um, it sounds like a small tank, 45 centimeter cube. It just comes down to space, available lighting, territory, uh, but they do use the same type of water if you're talking about clams. And then Marcus asked, did they cancel the Niagara meet? Yes. The Niagara coral uh, event has been postponed till mid-July because of the coronavirus. Um, Michael says, have you ever thought about doing the control frequency with Terrence from Apex? 
in any news on the TV show you got the call about. Number one, I have thought about it. Usually I'm just not available because he does this, this. He starts that stream during my shipping hour. I'm usually, my hair is on fire. I'm packing boxes. I'm printing labels. I'm getting to FedEx and the post office. I just don't have time. Uh, so that one hasn't happened. And uh, <clears throat> But, you know, there's always a chance something may come up where I will. And I haven't heard anything, which is pretty ominous. I'm assuming that means no bueno. So we'll see. But Oh, well. <laughs> Uh, the landscape company says, where is your trident located? I seem to have one of the mysterious ones where the calcium keeps climbing. Um, mine is located on the edge of my sump. I actually built the sump with an area to put the trident. So it sits there. It's its own parking spot. And it draws water from a spot in the skimmer section in an area with no bubbles. Uh, I noticed, you know, my calcium and magnesium bottles were almost empty. Like I told you, I just changed the reagent bottles here, um about three days ago, two days ago. And I noticed that my calcium was climbing. And I was really surprised. That's the first time I've seen that. And so when I opened the drawer to check the bottles, I was expecting to maybe see that the uh, the intake tube was at an angle possibly, but it appeared to be straight up and down. So I'm not really sure why that was happening. There was still a solution in the bottle. I've never had to do that. Um, every bottle I've done, the number stayed the same until it said empty, and then I hit reset to make it do even more, to use up the last of it <laughs> until it was empty, and it never had a, a climb, but it was climbing. It had climbed up like 50 points, and I said, you know what, whatever, I'm just change it, and it immediately came down. That's why my graph looks so uh, funny on here, because it uh, came right back down. I mean, it wasn't a big change. Let me pull this graph up really quick, and we'll scroll this up. So then we'll switch to this. Oh, I've got to move this. Hang on a second. I'm trying to rearrange things. So you can see how it. This was um, on the eighth Sunday. Was down around four eleven, and then ah, didn't mean to do that. Then here it started to rise and rise and rise. And I knew it wasn't. <laughs> it just was going up. And so I changed the reagent out and it dropped right to 424. So I was at 411 and now it's measuring 424 for the last two tests. So it's only up like 10 ppm from what it was. So this high range is misleading because that was a rise near the end of the bottle. I had about 12 tests left according to the, to the uh, Apex Fusion. And I decided, well, rather than going six more days and let this rise even higher, I'm just going to stop the bleeding and just reset it. So that is what I did. Oh, my neck is hurting. I'm gonna have to wrap this up. Let me look for the last couple of questions and then we will do our conclusion. GTA Vid says he has a clown kill another one and also killed a Blenny. Should I remove it and get another clown? It's going after my two firefish and loves to bite me. Yep, that clown's got to go. I would take it back to the store and tell him it's too aggressive and look for a new one that's not. Find a species that's not aggressive. I think you picked one that is aggressive. Um, like I said, Clarkies and Maroon clowns are both very aggressive clowns and will bite you. Uh, so you want something in the Ocellaris family. Those are much friendlier. Uh, St. Nova says, can a canopy with fans work out better than an open top with fans if the room is very humid? Actually, I would run a dehumidifier to protect your home. I talked about that a while back about the wear and tear on your home. So rather than allowing, I mean, because blowing air on a tank in humid air does nothing. It just blows humid air around. It, it can't help. But when the air is more dry, you can actually get evaporation. And that's what the cooling does. It's evaporative cooling. So you need to run a dehumidifier. Now the dehumidifier is going to add some heat to the room because there's heat coming out the back. I run mine every single night. And uh, this because we're having constant rain right now, I'm having to empty it once a day. But it was, uh, you know, less rain. It was just dry. And uh, I was having to empty it like once every week or two. It was great. But we're going to, you know, Texas, it's really humid. And as we uh, get closer to summer, I'll be emptying it twice a day. <laughs> or I'll just run it every night and then leave it off during the daytime. Because... 
while I'm up and about and working, I don't want to be in a room with a lot of heat and I don't have to run the AC to fight the dehumidifier. So I like to run it at night while I'm asleep and then in the day, the humidity's down in the house and then I run it again. And then every morning I empty it. That's what I do. Uh, what kind of plating Montiporas do you recommend? Plating? Plating. Um, well, Montipora Capricornus is the official plating Monty, and they come in different colors. There's orange, there's green, there's purple, like the grape Montipora. Those are all beautiful plates, uh, very popular. There's also a Monty that's green with blue polyps, and uh, that one's really pretty and plates out really nice, so I'd recommend that. And Redneck Reef is asking our last question of the stream. How would you sanitize a quarantine tank that recently had a fish with ick go through it? I would actually clean the entire tank with bleach water. Ten parts water to one part bleach. I would just scrub everything down, let it air dry. Well, rinse it really well, let it air dry for 24 hours, and then set it up anew for your next quarantine. Guys, thank you very much for enduring the super long live stream. We are right at almost four hours long, which is much too long, and some people will say, oh my god. But that's okay. We enjoy what we do, and we enjoy our tanks, and we love talking about all things hobby. Today's Water Test Saturday. Please test your water. Make sure that everything is right. If it's not, make adjustments so that your tank will do better. Clean things. Since you're homebound, you're stuck at home anyway, start wiping things down. Make things look brand new again. Clean the protein skimmer. Clean the waste collector. Clean the, uh, the top-off container that you've been using for years. It hasn't been wiped down in forever, right? It's time to drain it and clean it up, make it nice. Take apart pumps, clean up heaters, make sure the heaters are working right. Check everything, you know, start really inspecting. Make that tank look like the day you set it up because you'll appreciate it much more and you'll start getting compliments too. Like, man, the tank looks great. What did you do? And you're like, nothing. It's just how it is. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. We will have a live stream again next Saturday. And in the meantime, if you want to hang out, come visit me on Club Milo's Reef on Facebook. Bye, guys.